Welcome, welcome back to Beacon Pines. I I'm trying to do a scary voice. It kind of works. Helpfully though, I have two monitors now, which is pretty epic if I do say so myself. Uh, now I won't have to frantically switch screens and have lower quality game. Uh, resolution because I can have all of the stream stuff on one screen and the actual game on the other. You'll have to forgive me as I try to get my webcam set up in such a way that I look like I am actually speaking to you, the viewer, rather than uh, avoiding eye contact as I would in real life. But in the meantime, I'm back. I'm here with Beacon Pines. We are going to have some fun. Assuming put this up here actually not that you can see so I don't know why I'm saying this to you mm, is that too far I don't know can you still hear me okay I'm gonna assume you can and then if I end up wanting to change it we can do that so without further ado we'll hop back in I have completely forgotten where we left off Ah uh, yes, they were in the secret bunker basement thing uh, that Granny apparently made and then the Mr. Tolliver the Squirrel, one of Granny's collaborators, came down and they knocked him out and now I guess they're going to interrogate him. So, the interrogation of Hiram Tolliver, still unconscious, Mr. Tolliver slumped heavily in a shoddy old chair. His hands were bound with rope, his feet tied with some loose string. The kids huddled in a circle, discussing their plan. One thing was certain. They couldn't just let Mr. Tolliver go. They needed to know what he was doing in Luca's house. After some deliberation, it was decided. They'd run the classic good cop, blank cop interrogation. Chill cop. That'll work. Maybe. No, actually, good cop, chill cop. That's two good cops, though. Well, let's see. I'll handle this. Just gotta play it cool. Luca walked calmly to the light switch, flicking it off and on a few times. <laughs> Mr. Tolliver shook his head, gathering his wits. Golly, I sure got my bell rung! He looked over to find Luca, who returned a calming grin. Sorry, Mr. Tolliver. This was all a big mistake. Luca, what's going on here? Why do you have me strapped down? No one's fault, really. Rolo just got a little startled. Rolo's here? Rolo and Beck emerged from hiding to give a timid wave. Well, all right. Mistakes happen. You, they said tied him up with loose string. That's rope. You kids gave old Hiram a good scare. Let's just get me out of these ropes and call it even. Luca glanced over to Rollo and Beck, who replied with skeptical looks. Mr. Tolliver, why are you in my grand's basement? I'm here to help, of course. Help with what? What's my gran up to? If you'll just cut me loose, I can show you. How do I know we can trust you? Mr. Tolliver exhaled with disappointment. Luca, have I ever done wrong by you? No. And since your gran moved to town, haven't I been nothing but welcoming? Yeah. So why would I turn my back on your family now? It's just... 
All this stuff seems pretty weird. A board with names of people from town? An archive of my dad's old disturbing patient notes? Luca gestured to the corner. Barrels of explosives? <laughs> Probably should have started with that one, bud. I can explain everything. You just need to untie me. You kids deserve an explanation. No, no, we do not untie the man. Luca looked again to Rolo and Beck. This time they shrugged. Damn it. Luca began to slowly loosen the bindings. I mean, he appears to be a wimp, and yet, trust no one. Mr. Tolliver gently rubbed his wrists. That's a good lad. This will all make sense in time. He edged imperceptibly toward the stairs as he spoke. God damn it, what did I say? You see, this town has secrets, Luca. A very dark past, indeed. Before the kids had even noticed his movement, Mr. Tolliver was at the light switch. A past that must be brought to... He punctuated his final words by flicking the switch and rushing up the stairs. Light. Son of a... Beck darted to the wall and turned back on the lights. I mean, he didn't attack them, so that's good, I guess. It was too late. Rolo confirmed what they all heard. He... He just locked us down here. Mr. Tolliver's muffled voice came from behind the door. I wasn't lying, you know. This is for your own good. You kids just keep tight down there. Isn't it hang tight? And let the adults handle this. They looked bewildered at each other. Play it cool, huh? Not now, Beck. All right. They heard the staccato thump of quick steps exiting the house. The kids looked down in resignation. How is an adult squirrel larger than a small fox? Child fox or adult fox? This isn't how it goes down in Hank Atomic. For some reason, they'd always assumed it was up to them to save their town. Luca opened his mouth, hoping to conjure some magical words to make this right. Only a hollow croak escaped. The end. Okay, but like, that's not the worst outcome. Whatever. Well, we certainly aren't going to find a grand resolution to our tale locked in a basement. Back to the drawing board. Okay, so... We need to go back to the clouds breaking, and instead of meeting Rolo, I guess we'll have it rain. And see where we go from there. Rumble with ominous thunder. You sure we can make it home before the storm kicks off? Lucas surveyed the roiling clouds. I'd say the odds are good. Maybe you should stay here and I'll just make a break for it. At that moment, the heavens opened up, unleashing torrential rain. Care to recalculate those odds? Hurry inside, you two, before you catch cold! Oh, are they gonna have a sleepover? Luca, Nellie will keep trying to reach her gran on the phone. In the meantime, you two hold tight. Sorry, not much to do up here. Most of my stuff is still in the boxes. Mind if I poke around? Be my guest. Oh, come on, you're not gonna let me look at the bouquet. Thank you. Luca bent down to examine the bouquet of wilting flowers. Judging by the odor, they were well past their prime. Good cop, pungent cop? <laughs> he flipped open the attached card. Happy Cheryl's from Coach Walker and all the Fair, fair View Condors. Okay, so if these are animals, right? And their mascot is also an animal. That feels kind of weird, right? Right? Boy, you weren't kidding about poking around, huh? Oh, sorry. Was this from your old school? The most recent one, yeah. Some schools gave me going away cards. Some did flowers. When they're really trying to feel good about themselves, they do both. So, you've moved a lot. Yeah, that's the thing with having a brilliant parent. There's always a better job somewhere else. These flowers would last longer if you put them in some water. That's the sort of thing I would do if I cared. Well, you cared enough to keep them is all. Angsty. Oh, wow. Rolo and I have a radio just like this at the treehouse. Probably not exactly like this one. 
My mom and I tore the whole thing down to the bolts. Fitted it with some state-of-the-art vacuum tubes. She seems pretty awesome. She gets carried away sometimes. Thinks she feels guilty for working too much. So when she does have time for me, she showers me with high-tech overcompensation. Luca flicked at one of the toggles. I bet you can get all sorts of stations on this. Not out here in the boonies. You wouldn't believe the stuff I could pick up back in the city. But around here, it's all farm reports and static. Aw, shucks. Luca squinted into the eye hole of the microscope. This looks wild. What is it? Gum. Gum? Luca adjusted the slide with his fingers to get a better look. I'm tracking the structural integrity of gum with increasing amounts of chewing. Chewed that one for 47 days. Luca wiped his hand off on his sweater and gave a nervous laugh. It's weird. I know. Beck looked down, timidly tapping the ladder with her feet. You think it's weird, don't you? Has my music gotten too loud? Probably. A little. But weird can be cool. Luca, can I ask you something? Of course. <laughs> Dang, didn't that hurt? I'll be honest. That hurt more than I expected. Well, at least you look cool doing it. I'm getting Stranger Things vibes, possibly because I was watching scenes from Stranger Things. Not the actual TV show, just scenes. Beck took a moment to watch the rivulets of water running down the window. Do you ever feel alone? Like, even when people are around? Well, Rollo can be pretty absent-minded sometimes. I'm serious. Does it ever feel like your family doesn't care what you want? Um... It didn't used to feel that way. I know Gran loves me, but sometimes when she looks at me, it's like she's looking at a problem. Luca took a deep breath, exhaling slowly. I know the feeling. How do you deal with that? I guess I haven't yet. But one thing my dad told me when I was little, don't hold a grudge, especially against yourself. If you try to hold it all in, you're gonna pop. So then, what do you do when you don't know what to do? Dad never got to that part. Something I figured out on my own though. You gotta do something. Anything. Here. What are you doing? I don't know. Something. We're gonna register our complaints with the storm. Listen here, you miserable universe. Stop jerking me around. I just want things to go back to the way they were. Everyone tells me it's gonna be all right. That things are gonna change. Luca let out a feral scream that echoed into the night. I wish I could do one for you, my lovely viewers, but I, no. Every time something changes, everything gets worse. Screw this town. Oh my God, I'm gonna start crying. Whoa. Let me try. Moving sucks. I hate it. I hate that I hate it. Why can't I just deal with it and be happy for my mom? Why can't we just stay somewhere? <gasps> Her voice dropped down to a trembling whisper. I just want to be a normal kid. Beck brushed off her shirt and straightened up. There. Wow, I actually feel a little better. As abruptly as it began, the storm evaded. Thanks. I needed that. Me too. I should head out before the rain starts up again. Sure, I'll walk you out. See you and Rolo at the festival? Sounds good. Luca, don't let the universe jerk you around. Beck gave Luca a light thump on the arm before heading in. My poor aching heart. Chapter 5. Friendly Feud. The air was heavy with a hard rain's residue. The smell of wet things. Despite his dreary surroundings, Luca felt at peace. He never shared those details about his dad with anyone. Not even Rollo. But it's not like this changed anything. Rollo was still his best friend. Adding Beck to the group would help balance things out. Everything's better in threes. This was what Luca told himself as he headed to the street house. 
Okay, so we have not seen his grand come out in a, a hazmat suit talking with the heiress or anything. However, she did. Hey, Don, tracking down a lead? You bet. I heard a juicy new rumor. Turns out when Sharper Valentine died, he left behind a peculiar last will and testament. Peculiar? How? He didn't just give his kids an inheritance, there were conditions. What were... Okay, there was this book series I was obsessed with when I was a child called, I think, The 39 Clues, where all these different parts of the family were trying to find, I think it was a fortune, like, around the world, and they were all really underhanded and murdery, and it was great. <laughs> I was obsessed. I wanted to be one of them. Like what? The document stipulated that Eris had to take on a child as her ward. I still can't believe he named his daughter Eris. A kid our age, who just showed up to town one night with a lawyer. Solomon? Bingo! So Eris was forced to take care of him? Feel lucky, it could've been you. Yep, or she would've lost everything. Why would Sharper care so much about some random kid? Rumor has it, old Sharper sowed some wild oats. That explains the way Eris treats him. Poor Solomon. So he's her, like, really young brother, I guess. That's gotta be weird. How'd you find all this out? A good reporter never reveals her source, Luca. Well, apparently you missed all the fun that was over here. Ooh, glowy mushrooms. I like that games like these will always tell me that I shouldn't dilly-dally when really I'm just lost and I forgot which way I was meant to go. Do, do, do. How's our foreshadower? He met his old friend's eyes and was greeted with nothing but ice cold anger. Heavens! This is no time for fractured friendships. Love you. Mrs. Alligator Lady. Excuse me, what are you doing? Just locking up for the night, sir. Oh, wonderful. I can only assume this means all festival preparations have been completed ahead of schedule. Um, not exactly, sir. So they can say more words than questions about opinions. The storm set us back a bit, and it's getting late, so we all decided to... You all... Decided? Yes, sir. I was unaware that your job involved deciding things. We all are, we are all here at Perennial Harvest because we believe in creating a better future. Yes? I figured out how to do this voice. You just have to do a fake smile the entire time. Yes, sir. Very much, sir. Do you want to be the one to tell this town that we failed them? No. That we gave up because there was a little rainstorm and we all got sleepy? Of course not, sir. Good, then it's decided. Yes, sir, we'll work till the task is done. See that you do. Our harvest awaits. Can I poke around at anything? What's back here? Why can't I go back here? I mean, we did have the mutated child and clone hunt thing last time. I don't know how this will top it, but... I mean, it might top it with friendship drama, but I don't know what that's for. Well, are you still up there? <laughs> I'm sorry, Rolo isn't accepting visitors at the moment. Come back, never. Luca had only ever heard him speak in the stiff yet gentle tone a few times, and it always meant one thing. You're upset. Oh, what makes you say that? Maybe because my best friend abandoned me for no reason? I didn't abandon you. Just a little late. Rolo scoffed. The rain held me up. Liar! You weren't even home! What? The storm got bad and I got worried, so I went looking for you. 
Imagine my surprise when I made it to your house and you weren't there. I hadn't made it back yet. I'm not a fool, Luca. Doesn't take all day to deliver some jam. No, I... That storm rolled in out of nowhere and I got stuck after dinner at Beck's house. Luca stumbled on his words knowing he'd said too much. Beck. Dinner? What the heck is a Beck? She's a new kid in town. She's actually kind of cool. You'd like her. She needed help convincing her parents that she made new friends. New friends? Is this like a Ron Weasley thing? Ew. I spent all day waiting for you and you are making new friends? Oh wait, I think I had Rolo's voice deeper, didn't I? It's not like that, Rolo. You know, while I was waiting, I made some upgrades to mission control. It was gonna be a surprise. But you took so long, this storm knocked it all down. Just like you knocked down our friendship! The dramatic little... <laughs> what does that even mean? Luca became instinctively angry in response. Both boys were now shouting across the distance. Ooh, we love puberty. It means you're a bad friend! You're mean, Katie! You're just a mean girl! You don't care about me! Of course I care, you ass! I knew I'd get in trouble waiting so late for you. But I kept my word, because that's what friends do! Oh wow, what a noble sacrifice you made! Easy for you to say! Your grand doesn't even care, Jesus Christ! You can stay out as long as you want, and you wouldn't even get in trouble! Seriously? You're acting like I chose this? If that's what you think, then maybe you're the bad friend. Rolo's tone changed to a calm yet more intense anger. Maybe Pa's right. Storms bring more than water. This one brought out the real Luca. Stop quoting your Pa's nonsense like it means anything. Yeah, well, at least my Pa's still around. The words hung in the cold night air. What is with this man? Or boy bringing up the fact that his friend is parentless and has a grandmother who is slightly absent. Jesus Christ. Rolo's stomach dropped, knowing he'd crossed the line. But it was too late. Luca, I... Good night, Rolo. Dang it. Let the kid say fuck. Let the kid say fuck. No radio? Well, I guess he didn't bring it back. Luca dug through his old stuff, not even sure what he was looking for. Can I play with the... What a jerk! Good cop, jerk cop? Call me a bad friend. Ooh, I'm Rolo. Look at me and my amazing family. I'm gonna keep doing this. <laughs> oh, I was hoping that would break something. Rolo thinks I'm so going to fess with him, he can shove it. What else can I look at? Can I go out of the, the room? Rolo. Oh, fine. Maybe that's me. Fine. Can I keep kicking this? Can I kick it and then the rug will go out and it's like another secret passage that inexplicably his grandmother managed to build without anyone noticing? I was also hoping I would break something and then that would give uh, something, but maybe not. Charge! No? Really? Can I break the desk lamp? I'm not allowed to have fun. Fine. I guess I'm just never supposed to make new friends. Good cop, weep cop? M maybe. Luca? Grand cooed gently from the hallway. You slept straight through breakfast. Luca, are you alright? I'm fine. Just don't feel like getting up yet. Okay, I'll leave this oatmeal by the door. I've gotta run out and take care of some things. Okay. I'll be back later to check in. Sure. Luca just wanted to be alone. He waited to hear the sound of the front door closing. Time to kick things. 
bet Rolo's still gonna go to the festival. Hmm. It's gonna be miserable. Are you sure I can't break anything? Fine. Can I snoop on Grand's bed? Can I jump on this chair? No. Brillo thinks I'm still going to the festival with him. He can shove it. Can I not leave this room? Did I miss something? You want me to go back to sleep? Luca dozed off again. Okay, to be fair, this is what I would do with depression. Luca, I see you didn't eat your oatmeal. Wasn't hungry. Well, just in case you get hungry, I'll leave a sandwich here too. Thanks. Rolo came by. What did he say? He wanted to talk to you. What did you say? I told him you weren't feeling well. Good. So, your plan is to just sit in your room all day? Pretty much. Well, I need to pop away again for a minute. If you decide to end your pity party and go outside, I think it'd do you some good. <laughs> now she wants us out of the house. Noted. Lucas still couldn't bring himself to go out. Besides, if he ran into Rolo, he'd have to actually confront the situation. Can I kick this some more? <laughs> There's never anything interesting at the festival anyway. Oh lord, don't make me aim. I can't aim things, what are you talking about? Nope. Alright, this is gonna be the next uh, hour of our stream as I try to hit a book with a soccer ball instead of being like a normal person and climbing on a chair. Okay, that was close. The Adventures of Hang Atomic, the complete first volume. Luca carefully opened the cover and began to read. Rolo had received it for his birthday, a special hardcover edition with behind-the-scenes commentary and bonus art. Rolo cherished it, but asked that Luca keep it at his house. Luca wasn't sure if it was because Rolo didn't trust himself with it, didn't trust his sister around it, or just wanted an excuse to come hang out at Luca's more often. Whatever the reason, Luca didn't mind, but it had stayed right there where Rolo stashed it ever since. Now, at the foot of his bed, Luca lost himself in the pages. He'd read it all before, but at this moment, it somehow felt sentimental. He was well into issue number five when he heard soft footsteps from the hallway. Luca? Another little friend came to see you. A girl named Beck Modeville. I don't know how to... I'm gonna assume it's German pronunciation. <laughs> she said you met yesterday? What did she say? Is she here? She was just dropping by. I told her you weren't taking visitors today. Oh, she seems nice. Yeah, you had a fight with Rolo, didn't you? Can I come in? Maybe later. All right then, I'll leave dinner on the kitchen table in case you want a bite before bedtime. Without realizing it, Luca had pouted away the entire afternoon. He once again felt the weight of it all and allowed his weary eyes to close. Luca stood in a vast black expanse. He looked up at his father standing beside him. Walt was working a straw at the bottom of a fountain glass, trying to collect the last bits of milkshake. He doesn't have this connection with his mom, I guess. Although he doesn't think she's dead, so. Dad, where are we? Taking a final loud gurgling sip, his father peered up from the glass. He jangled the straw playfully with a warm smile then lifted the empty glass as if to point into the darkness. The source. Luca's eyes followed his father's gesture. In an instant, he was sitting in front of a blazing campfire. Across from him sat a large figure in a yellow hazmat suit. The figure's voice was a scratchy echo. Well, if it isn't the man of the hour, make yourself comfortable. Luca held his shivering hands over the flame to warm himself. It doesn't work that way here. Their yellow gloved hand pointed to the base of the flame. It's a cold flame, see? Luca peered at the base of the fire. It wasn't wood that was burning. It was beacon pine itself. Tiny buildings freezing and crumbling as they were consumed by flame. Luca could see small shadows moving in the burning city. People. 
Luca leapt to his feet. We've got to help them! The figure gave a dismissive wave of their hand. Why waste energy helping people who can't even help themselves? The figure bent down to examine the panicked crowd as they desperately tried to stop the flames. They only care about what's right in front of them. Not like us. Luca's voice was a trembling whisper. Us? The figure slowly stood up, grabbing his helmet with both hands. With a jolt and a twist, the suit emitted a gasp. A cloud of torpid mist escaped, slowly revealing the face within. Luca's own face looked back at him. Older. Worn. Distant. The sensation was oddly familiar. As if he'd caught his own reflection by surprise in the mirror. The doppelganger smiled. I tried to help once. He gestured towards his face. And all it got me was this. Luca staggered back. You aren't me! Luca felt a hand catch his shoulder. His father was there again, beside him. Every choice sets us on a path. This is the end of one of your paths, son. Luca watched his older self shake its head ruefully, its face twisting into a cruel grin. Well, Dad, if you wanted him to see this, far be it for me to disappoint. Luca watched in shock as the figure took a confident step forward and plunged into the flames. In a flash of cold light, he was gone. What does all of this mean? Luca felt a reassuring squeeze on his shoulder. Just remember why we choose matters just as much as what we choose. Luca woke up to see a hazy figure at the foot of his bed silhouetted in the morning sun. Mom? No, dear. It's only Gran. Luca rubbed his eyes. The kind, concerned face of his Gran came into focus. How are you feeling? Fine. Anything you want to talk about? I don't feel like talking. That's just as well. How about you sit there and listen a bit? Whatever you and Rolo fought about doesn't matter. But he... Gran silenced Luca with a gentle pat on the leg. Fights between friends happen. What was said doesn't matter. The important thing is that it's not the last thing you ever say to each other. But he said stuff about Dad. Well, do you think he meant it? No. He was just mad. Mm, and did you mean any of the things you said to him? No. Good. One must appreciate friends in their best moments and accept them in their worst. Good cop. Accepted cop. <laughs> now get your little butt out of bed. The festival's today. You don't want to miss that, do you? I guess not. Seems like a good opportunity to make amends with Rolo, doesn't it? Luca gave a reluctant nod. So buy him a corn dog and apologize. But he's the one that... What did I just say? Buy him a corn dog. There's a good boy. Everything's better with corn dogs. I need to get going now. Got some last minute festival business to take care of. I'll come find you at the fountain a little after lunch. All right. I love you, Luca. Love you too. Luca took a deep breath. Okay. Chapter six, through thick and thin. I never know, like, should we go back and, or just, okay. Despite Luca's bitterness, Gran was right. He needed to hash things out with Rolo. B, B, I'm clicking B, let me go to the tree. A big fight changes the nature of a friendship. Whether in the end it is for the better or for the worse, all comes down to understanding. They use more commas than I do, this is impressive. If one is not careful, the same familiarity that builds the strongest bo of bonds can become the wrecking ball that shatters them. Luca emerged from seclusion, taking in the crisp festival air. But the events of the day weren't on his mind. He had to find Rolo. No, I want to go back to the cup place. Where even are we? Okay. So we did that, and then we... Oh no, we don't have anything for the hostile interrogation. 
Now I just wanna, okay. So we've done this, we've done this, we've done this, and then we've done this. So wherever we are is the only place we can go. There you are, Luca. Rolla wanted me to tell you something. What is it? Roxy rolled her eyes, shaking her head. <sighs> A space adventure, though you needn't buy it. If ye be brave, go somewhere quiet. Uh, Roxy, I don't... It's a riddle, Luca. My goofy little brother wants you to find him. The answer is the library. Luca looked down and kicked at the dirt. Look, I know you two had a fight. The only thing more annoying than my little brother is my little brother without his best friend. So I'm doing him this one favor. Now I need one favor from you. Whatever it is that went down between you two, squash it. It's the library. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint if we wanted to have a mystery solving time. It's super definitely the library. Not gonna touch any of the food or drink. Why is no one weirded out that all of these people look the same? Piper, you're actually taking a break from studying. I wanted to see what all the festival fuss is about, but I can't help but notice you still brought your backpack full of books. Luca, backpacks can carry a lot more than just books. True, true. So what you got in there? Books. <laughs> I see you, child. I relate. Haha. -ha. The library, some are quiet. I know, that's, that's what I said. Hi, Luca! Kato's eyes lit with excitement. I've been expecting you! Bravo in deciphering the first riddle! The first? Oh, you didn't think that was all, did you? Rolo does go all out, doesn't he? Kato straightened up and cleared his throat as if preparing to sing. <clears> throat> On planet Farpole, you may take issue. When the fifth king dies, you'll need a tissue. Kato stared at Luca eagerly. Get it? Want me to tell you? No, it's okay, let me figure it out. All right, when you find it, bring it here to be verified. And if you decide you want to hit, the offer still stands. Yes, the fifth issue. Luca grabs natural photography. No, not that one. I think the comics were up here? Luca grabbed The Adventures of Hank Atomic, issue five. There we go. Ah, you found it! Kato removed his book from the desk and replaced it with Luca's, turning on the lamp. Why do you have a UV light there? Two words glowed. The Adventures of Hank Atomic, issue five. Luca clicked his tongue with recognition. Rolo cipher pen. He used to write secret messages everywhere with that. And only I had the special flashlight needed to reveal it. But I lost it. Well, apparently he, par he traded Jeff for this purple light bulb. Parted with his entire Halloween candy stash. Oh, Rolo. Now let's see here. God, I still hate those wing hands. Kato began flipping through the pages, stopping when he hit a glowing word. Get away with such a grift, he continued flipping. Only found in Grub. Cart. Reaching the end of the book, Kato looked up. That's it. Grift in Grub Cart? Griffin. Griffin's Grub Cart. He wants me to go to Griffin's snack stand. Ah, brilliant. I guess you're off then? Good luck on the rest of the scavenger hunt. Thanks, Kato. I thought he meant the bug kid, actually, because I forgot his name, but I knew, you know, bugs, grubs. Um, okay, that's up here. Nope, that's the newsstand. Should I eavesdrop on these people? Sure. I was able to return the perennial harvest safety suit you borrowed. I don't think anyone noticed. Good. Now will you tell me what you needed it for? 
It was a favor for an enemy of my enemy. This isn't going to harm Mr. Kerr, is it? All you need to know is that it's for the good of the family. How's our foreshadower doing? I guess nothing. Hello, are you Griffin? Yes. Hey Griffin, did Rollo come? Before Luca could finish his sentence, Griffin handed him a corn dog. Oh, that's it? Bought and paid for, enjoyed. I thought there was supposed to be a riddle or something. Luca shrugged, taking a sizable bite out of the corn dog. What is a corn dog? Yuck. It's cold! Oh yeah, that's been sitting here for a while. Rolla wanted me to be sure to give you that one specifically. Well, that's just... Luca tongued at his cheeks, feeling something rough between his teeth. He reached into his mouth and pulled out a slip of paper. Ugh, come on. He shook off the bits of corn dog to read the slip. A pick up when you need some pep near the fountain up the step. Luca finished off the remainder of the corn dog. It's getting to be a whole thing. Coffee time. With the lesbian cats. Luca, did you know the Beacon Pines is actually unincorporated? A lot of people don't know that. Wow, yeah, I didn't know. What's that mean? It means most public workers are handled internally. We do all the pipelines, the water treatment, bu building regulations. Mm, that's great. Census taking, police work. Police work in emergency services. That means no one's gonna help you from the outside. Oh Lord. Hello. This is the first time I've seen this many smiling faces since the fall harvest. I had my doubts about perennial harvest, but I must admit they do put on a nice party. They do? I see balloons and a scary survey guy at a survey booth. Hi ladies. There you are, Luca. There's no way I'm actually doing this. It's way below my pay grade. Oh, come on, you big stiff. Let the kids have some fun. Fine. But Rollo owes me one. Lumi waved his hands. Oh, he's a dude? Huh. As he began. What takes flight but has no wings? Your final task of friendship brings. See, that wasn't so hard. Good cop, hard cop. I feel cheapened somehow. I think it's sweet. What takes flight but has no wings, your final task of friendship brings. Good luck, Luca. Well, that was easy. Hey. Hey. Did you find the comic book? Yep. And you got the corn dog? Yeah. Well then, I know it doesn't make up for what I said, but here, you've earned this. Rolo sheepishly handed Luca the balloons. That'll be useful. Thanks. You didn't have to go to all this trouble. I'm sorry I got so mad. Dang it, you were supposed to let me apologize first. Oh, sorry. Now you've apologized twice before me. Just let me do this. Luca, I'm really sorry. With everything that's happened with your mom and all, I've always wanted to be there for you. Be a good friend, you know? When you said you were hanging out with someone else, I kind of freaked out. Rolo, still my turn. I felt like if you needed some new friend to help you, it meant that I wasn't good enough. But that was selfish and wrong. I was wrong. I'm so sorry, Luca. Okay, apology over. You can talk now. <laughs> Luca threw himself at Rolo, hugging him as tightly as he could. Uh, Rolo, I don't deserve you. I don't deserve you either. That's why we deserve each other. So, what else do you want to do today? We could snoop around and try to find some info about your mom. Snoop where? We could probably sneak into Perennial Harvest HQ while everyone's at the festival, which is in front of the Perennial Harvest HQ. <laughs> Aren't you curious about all that stuff the clipboards write down? What if we get caught? I think I've had enough excitement for one week. Let's just make the rest of the day about us. Really? Yeah, the rest of the world can wait one more day. You know, I have been wanting to get some work done on the MCDC at Missing Control. The aim is a bit unpredictable. 
That sounds perfect. What if I just, just had a peek? <laughs> Every single time. Yep. Oh god, that's what that was. Wait for it. Unexplained sound once again noted. Where the fuck did he get explosives? Like clockwork. What a bunch of drones. <laughs> I mean, I do kind of support that, but also where did he get explosives? Jeff was staring into the distance with a wistful look. Hey, Jeff. Everything all right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, everything's fine. I mean, used to be fine. Just ain't right these days, you know? Hold on, I gotta do this properly. <clears throat> I really do, actually. Jeff turned to Luca with a furrowed brow, then gave an understanding nod. You do, don't ya? Nope, that's not deep enough that I was trying to do this voice. For a moment, the two shared the same wistful gaze. Hello? Ain't moving. I mean, fair enough, but... I don't know who Perennial Harvest thinks they're impressing with this ridiculous festival. Totally. The town's still falling apart, the weather's still cruddy, and the season's harvest looks like it's gonna be worse than last year's. You said it. No amount of corporate pandering is gonna change any of that. Exactly. But... The lemonade stand at the drink... The lemonade at the drink stand over there does look pretty tasty. Fits. I'm still gonna be mad at them, I'd just rather be mad while slipping some delicious lemonade is all. Oh dear. Unique New York, unique you New York, you know <laughs> you know you need unique New York. Oh god, my drama kit's coming out. Huh? Oh, don't mind me, just warming up for my big ceremony speech. Mr. Kerr pointed to his grinning mouth. Gotta limber up the old guy box. You nervous? Oh, heavens no. Well, break a leg. Give me the gift of a grip of a sock. Okay, let's see if I can do this. Go back into theater kid days. Don't scream. It's fine, you're not there. What did you do to die today at a minute or two to two? A thing distinctly hard to say but harder to do. And there were two, a rat to a rat to two, and the dragon will come when he hears the drum at a minute or two till two today and a minute or two till two. Still got it. Captions maybe did not get it, but I still got it. How goes the beetle hunt? Pretty rotten. I haven't seen so much as an XUVA. And it's not just the beetles. This morning I couldn't find any critters at all. It's like everything that buzzes or skitters just packed up and left. I'm sure they're out there somewhere. Maybe all the commotion of the festival just spooked them. Yeah, maybe that's it. Hello. I think like five people in this town. Did you hear? After Mr. Kerr gives his big speech, they're gonna have the first annual biggest catch competition. Long as a boot qualifies as a catch, I'm a shoe in. Good luck. All right, let's fix this up. Oh, I almost forgot. I ran into your grand this morning. She asked me to give you this. Rollo handed Luca an unopened letter. I'll wait for you inside if you want to read it now. A letter? Luca, some things are going to happen that might be difficult for you to understand. If I am honest, I hardly understand them myself. But whatever happens, I need you to know that I love you. None of this is fair to you. You've already lost so much. We both have. I wish there was a simpler way forward, but if there is, I haven't thought of it. God knows I've tried. Everything I've done, I did for you. I hope someday you can accept that. Love, Gran. I love you too, Gran. Luca folded the paper into his pocket and headed up the letter. The town's gonna explode, isn't it? What's up with the letter? Anything you want to talk about? Maybe later. Sure, whenever you want. And then the two boys fell asleep safe in their treehouse while the town blew up. You know, you really didn't have to go to all that trouble just to apologize. I know, but we've been looking forward to the festival for weeks. 
After I ruined everything with my big mouth, this was the best way to make sure you still had a good time without me. Rolo. Luca was at a loss for words, but that was fine. Words aren't always necessary. The festival seemed nice. Was it nice? We can still go. Nah, this is fine. Well, there's always next year. Sadly, this was untrue. A distant rumble shook the treehouse, and then they all died at the end. I told you they were gonna blow it up. Huh? What was that? Oh man, we missed the fireworks? It was not fireworks. It was something the boys couldn't possibly comprehend. Something as old and cruel as time itself. Cthulhu? This really said, let's have these two boys have a sweet friendship bonding moment and then murder them. A shockwave of cold tore through the room. A bitter, unfathomable chill. Have you ever been to Minnesota in the winter? Before they could react and encase them in ice, two boys, reunited by friendship, only to be cruelly separated by a malevolence beyond reason. And so, our story ends on this melancholy scene, in a silent treehouse turned statuary, in a town brought low by its secrets as a pair of friends, alone together, for the rest of time. The end. Nope. That can't be the ending. It simply can't. I won't accept it, and I hope you won't either. There are more endings. More possibilities. I can feel it. We're just going to have to sort through them all until we find one that fits. Okay, so we've done that, which means it's cop time. Good cop, hard cop. I uh, don't know why we couldn't have just gotten bad, but whatever. Rollo brandished a steely gaze. Oh, God bless. I've got this. Read about it a hundred times. Oh, he still has his detective hat. Rolo swaggered past the chair, which propped up the slumping harem Tolliver. Without even looking at his captive, he began with a long, blustery drawl. I am going to attempt to do an imitation of the detective whose name I have already forgotten, played by J the guy who plays James Bond, who I also already forgotten in Knives Out. Well, 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 Mr. Tolliver. I realize I already did this for the bad guy, but whatever. Mr. Tolliver remained motionless. Rollo spun around to face him. He clearly expected to rouse Mr. Tolliver with his booming voice. Mr. Tolliver? Becca and Luca gave each other an unsure glance. Rollo slammed his fist on the table. I said, Mr. Tolliver! He grabbed the table lamp and beamed it onto the unconscious face. Jesus Christ! Mr. Tolliver groaned and slowly lifted his head. He recoiled with a muddled, weary squint. What in the world? The chair wobbled as he attempted to straighten up. Who? Who's there? Mr. Tolliver could only make out rough shapes glare through the glaring light. With a gruff tone, Rollo hoped to both conceal his voice and intimidate. I'll be asking the questions. Now I just went to New York. I'll be asking the questions here, punk. Now hold on, let's just calm down. Oh, I am calm. Calm as a carrot in dirt. As for you, looks like you're sweating. The doubtful expression on Beck and Lucas' faces transformed into awe. We can do this my way, or... Well, let's just say I've never needed another way. Rollo, hitting his stride, was now channeling every detective trope his memory could recall. He slammed the table again. Now dance! What? <laughs> you have a dance with the devil in the pale moonlight? <laughs> Mr. Tolliver's voice became desperate. He was nearly in tears. You've tied me down. How on earth could I dance? Dance with your mouth, punk. Spell the beans! I decided Rollo would just switch accents to sound like various detectives, and I will do the same. What are you doing poking around this house? I'm here to help Juniper. To make sure everything's ready. Oh, so you're in cahoots with Gran? Gran? Mr. Tolliver was in a daze. Now more confused than ever. Gonna help her blow up the festival, eh? Blow up the festival? Good lord! He shook his head, feeling more and more dizzy. No, 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 you've got it all wrong. Where is she? 
She's headed to the source. Source? What's the source? It's where... His voice faded to a whisper. The town began. Where it all began. What is Operation Sparkplug? With that, Mr. Tolliver passed out cold. I mean, we didn't really need the good cop, did we? Rolo swung around with a repentant glance. Damn, Rolo. I think you went a little too hard on him. What did he say about the source? It's where the town began? We need more information. Yeah, but we better not push Mr. Tolliver any further. Is there anyone else who might know more? What about the History Museum? It just got set up for the festival. Nah, that tent was put up by the Valentines. Everything they do is just a bunch of fluff to glorify themselves. Is there anything more reliable? The library. If there's any information about the source thing, Cato can help us find it, because this is inexplicably staffed by a child. Let's go get some answers. This is a dang nice library. Thanks, we work hard on it. Aren't you a little young to be a librarian? Uh... Kato hung out here so much, eventually they gave him a set of keys. I just keep an eye on the place for Miss Novak sometimes. They got you working for free? It's quiet and I get access to all the books I can read. What more could a person want? Fair enough. What can I do for you all? We need a favor. I already told you in Rolo I can't put you any higher on the wait list for the next Hank Atomic. And if you're here with more candy, I'll have you know I can't be bought. Call it a personal code of conscience. Actually, we're looking to do some research. Now you're speaking my language. What are you looking for? That's the thing. We sort of don't know. What do you got on the history of the town? Mmm, there's the county record archives. What's in those? Births, deaths, newspaper clippings, stuff like that. Pretty boring reading, but they do go all the way back to when the town was founded. Great, we'll start there. Chapter 8. Six feet under, three towns over. The kids spent the rest of the afternoon combing through dusty piles of old county records, desperately searching for anything that could help them make sense of Mr. Tolliver's cryptic utterance. Luca tried to shake the thought of Grand's basement, but his focus wavered. Explosives? Messages hidden in jam? Dossiers on various town figures and a corkboard dotted with photos? Grand was the only family he had left. He still couldn't bring himself to believe the worst. But the old map with the symbol of explosives in Town Square made that difficult. As the sun began to set, the kids were no closer to the truth. I want there to be a secret room behind Kato very badly. If I have to read any more records, my eyeballs are gonna pop. We have to keep digging. If I dig another word, I'm gonna end up in one of those asinine death records. Rollo Cotter lived a full and wonderful life till he read so much boring crud that his brain oozed out of his ears. Rollo shut his book with an assertive nod. If you've got a better idea, spit it out. You sound like my sister. Keep pushing your luck, pal, and it won't be boring county records that kill you. I'll put you in the obituaries myself. Rollo muttered under his breath. You're a county record. Really? That's the best you got? When I'm done with you, you'll be the footnote in history. Just like... Beck slammed her finger down on the open page before glancing down to read. Jay Hartford here. I'd love to see you try. Hey, hey, hey. We're all a little tired here. Let's just take a minute and... Something tickled the back of Luca's mind. Wait, what was that name back? In the obit? Jay Hartford. From the Brookville Tribune eight years ago. That can't be right. What is it? Jay Hartford. That's my grand's name. Juniper Hartford. Maybe there were two Jay Hartfords? Mrs. Hartford is survived by her young daughter, E. Hartford... My mom's name is Eleanor. Okay, this is getting creepy. If your gran is six feet under three towns over, then who am I living with? The question hung in the air. What the fuck? I really hope that she is the only human person in this town. <laughs> Alright gang, I gotta close up for the night. Beck rubbed her eyes. How late is it? 
Almost ten. Oh crap, Pa's gonna kill me. Gotta go. Yeah, my parents will be worried sick. Okay, let's meet up as early as we can at the festival tomorrow. What are you gonna do about the unconscious man in your basement? I'll think of something. Luca's heart was pounding as he approached the house. If he was lucky, Gran, or whoever it was, hadn't gotten back yet. And of course, there was Mr. Tolliver, tied up and unconscious in the basement. <laughs> Dealing with him would be the first order of business. Luca shook out his arms to calm his nerves before entering. He held perfectly still, tempering his breath and listened closely. She was asleep. His only hope was that she hadn't found Mr. Tolliver before dozing off. If she had, do we think she'd be able to just fall back asleep in front of the fire? Because I would think no. Oh no. Mr. Tolliver was nowhere to be seen. Maybe he woke up, escaped from his bindings, and left without a trace? Or maybe Gran knew everything. What do we do? Luca's hungry stomach groaned. Not realizing it, he'd gone the entire day without eating. Mood. Okay, I can figure this out. Just need a little brain food. Luca rushed over to the pile of jam jars, unscrewed one, and shoveled a handful into his mouth. Dude, what the fuck? I'm afraid your jam delivery will be delayed. He flipped the lid to read the label. Mr. Nuncreed. <laughs> okay, now I can think. Oh god, is this gonna be drugged? So if Gran knows we tied up Mr. Tolliver, I'm screwed. If she doesn't know, then I need to play it cool. I guess the only option is to go to bed and act as if nothing is wrong? Gran will think Mr. Tolliver finished what he was sent to do and left when he was done. Or maybe it's just normal jam, because she gives him jam so that he isn't suspicious of the fact that she gives other people jam with notes. Gran? Okay, stick to the plan. Go to bed, play it cool. No, that rug is askew. That rug is askew. As Luca climbed of the final stair, the emotion of the day dragged heavily on him. With each consecutive step, his legs began- God damn it! His stride began to falter. He tried to grab for the railing to steady himself. Something was wrong. Come on, legs. Just a few more steps. <laughs> also me. <laughs> I did actually stand up from my wheelchair too fast once and face planted onto the ground. <laughs> Passed out. <laughs> Luca groaned and tried to move. His limbs might as well have been bolted to the ground. Through numb lips, he mumbled just before falling asleep. Glad to know we achieved that quest. Sweet boy. What did you get yourself into? Rest now and let me handle everything. Why do they have so many rugs in this house? Chapter 9. A Speech to End All Speeches Luca awoke to find himself face down in bed. He moaned into his pillow. Why would Gran drug him? Or rather, why was she trying to drug Mr. Nuncreed? Sexual harassment. But also, he's a bad guy. Well, you'd be a bad guy if you didn't mean to. Shaking the questions from his woozy head, Luca snapped back to the matter at hand. The festival! Try the closet. No. Try the pants. <laughs> Check and see if the door is still askew. Okay, so we've given up on pretense here, I suppose. Can I just like take one of those explosive? Is that a punching bag? Oh my god, it is. Can I keep hitting it? I guess she's ready to fight. <laughs> That's good. Dun, dun, dun. Can I see what herbs she's growing that are drugs? <laughs> what do we think? Okay. 
Can I take a broom or something as a weapon? No. Fine. Was that drawer always open? I don't think it was. Oh, but there's nothing in it. Fine. Fine, fine. I'll go to the festival. Do, do, do. Wait, check on the grave. Although I guess I kind of thought uh, his gran was related to his dad, not his mom. But obviously that's not the case. No, I can't get any, like, moral support from daddy. Okay. Do, 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 do. Is she in a dress? No. Where have you been? Uh, Grant put something in the jam. Yeah, we know. Secret messages for secret conspir con conspirators? Yeah. Not this one. The one intended for Mr. Nuncreed put me to sleep. Ho ho ho! Sly devil. <laughs> Think she's trying to remove him from the equation. He might be in danger. Oh good god, don't help him. Have you found anything? We looked around, but haven't seen anything odd. Your grand's nowhere to be found, but Mr. Nuncreed's just loafing around waiting for the speech. What speech? Mayor Gus just got up to the podium. Everyone's gathering at the stage. Let's get moving. Oh god, I have to give a speech. Alright. Hey look, it's all ten people. Augustus Valentine nervously wiped his brow. <clears throat> Is this thing, uh... Uh, hello, Beacon Pines. I'm Augustus Valentine, your mayor, and... I suppose you already know that. Uh, oh yes, before we get started, I just wanted to take a moment to recognize someone who couldn't be here today. This town wouldn't be where it is today without my father, Sharper Valentine. So I thought we could begin with a round of applause befitting such a great man. My dude, he's dead. <laughs> Even that's more than the old codger deserved. Gus cleared his throat and awkwardly looked at his tie. Right, where where was I? William Kerr bounded on stage with the energy of a preacher in a Big Ten revival. Gus Valentine, everyone! He gave Gus a hearty slap on the back and motioned him off the stage. Let's hear it for our mayor. What a great turnout. Ah, heck, I didn't prepare anything. But I suppose I could say a few words. It would be a shame to waste such a beautiful podium. Mr. Kerr pulled a thick sack of cards out from his vest. Community, conviction, commitment. These are the things we celebrate at Perennial Harvest. For us, these are the pillars of the bridge to a better tomorrow. But I think it's time to add a new pillar. Change. Change is a powerful thing. It's inexorable, unavoidable, and undeniable. And I am daggum thankful for it. Change is the reason we're all together today. It's hard for me to believe that it was only four years ago when fate brought me here. A simple business trip which brought me to a small town which would change my life forever. Mr. Kerr took a moment to survey the crowd. You know what? He wiped away a single tear. From the second I set foot in Beacon Pine, something about this place held me captive. You see, change represents opportunity. It represents potential. It was change that helped me recognize the potential of this place. To see that the people of this town, despite suffering such great loss, Still held on to the things that made them special. He thumped the podium to emphasize each word. Community. Conviction. Commitment. Change. Mr. Kerr nodded confidently, biting his lip. The crowd was silent in rapt attention. Fate made a perfect match that day. Nothing is more important to you all than community. And perennial harvest is a community first and foremost. Mr. Kerr methodically made eye contact with each section of the crowd. The only way you made it through the foul harvest was an unshakable conviction. A conviction that a better tomorrow was just over the horizon. 
Perennial Harvest was founded on the conviction that we are that horizon. This festival is our symbol of our commitment to each other. His voice began to build to a crescendo. We now walk hand in hand into a future we will shape together. And that is what change is all about. Grabbing the future by the scruff of the neck and making things happen. Change is a choice. I am tickled pink that we will all be making that choice together. How great is that? Just imagine what we can accomplish. What was that? The crowd began to look around nervously. Don't worry, a little thunder isn't going to ruin this day. Everyone remained calm. Mr. Kirk quickly flicked through his note cards. Where was I? Through all of my travels, I have learned one true thing. One always reaps what they sow. We have all planted a lot of good in this town. And so it is with a happy heart that I can compl- Can decree. I said that one wrong. He raised his hands toward the heaven. Our harvest awaits. God damn it. At that moment, a merciless wall of impossibly cold air ripped through the crowd, instantly freezing everyone and everything it touched. For a man like William Kerr, this was a fitting way for things to end. On a stage, with an entire town frozen in rapt attention, for the rest of time. The end. There's that ice again! Whenever I think we're getting close, it comes along and ruins everything. Maybe we should just quit. Maybe you should just close the book, walk away, and never think of me again. No. I don't mean that. We got a little closer this time. We just need to try again. Please. I guess it's sly cop time? I don't know what that means. Luca and Rolla duck behind a barrel, leaving Beck to her task. With a few crisp snaps, she roused Mr. Tolliver. What? What's going on here? You're that Modeville girl. Please, call me Beck. Sorry about all this. Mr. Tolliver looked down and shifted a bit, testing his restraints. It seems there's been a mix-up. You see, I'm down here for the same reason you are. Juniper sent you here? Beck caught herself before letting the surprise manifest on her face. She'd already gotten him to reveal his relation to Gran. This was going to be easy. You know how Juniper is with her precautions. Operation Sparkplug has us all on edge. I guess she thought you need some backup. But she sent a child? What better way to avoid prying eyes? Who would suspect a kid? I suppose that makes sense. Mr. Tolliver wriggled a bit in his restraints. Oh, I'm sorry. Beck quickly removed the ropes. That had to be uncomfortable. A little, yeah. But you understand. We never know who to trust in this town. Mr. Tolliver rubbed the growing knot on his forehead. Very true. So, it turns out we're both here to... Bep twirled her hand as if to prompt Mr. Tolliver to finish her thought. Destroy the evidence. Beck shook her head and clicked her tongue. Yep, the old gal is nothing if not thorough. Mr. Tolliver let out an amused huff in agreement. She sure is. Can't blame her, though. If anyone were to find out that we're going to destroy the source... Well, we both know how bad that might be. No one will know anything once I finish cleaning up things down here. Beck was on a roll now, playing Mr. Tolliver like a fiddle. You're sure you can finish this up on your own? Juniper trusted me for a reason. You can leave the rest to me. Good, there's one mo more loose end I'll go work on. Loose end? Oh, it's nothing really. The other day I had the radio on scan while restocking the candy shelf. Wouldn't you know it, I intercepted an odd phrase in a perennial harvest transmission. Underground secrets. That's ominous. I think it might be a password, but Juniper dismissed it. Said it wasn't mission critical. What's the password for? We don't know. So we have a password and nowhere to put it? It's gotta be something, right? Good thinking. You should probably go work that out. I've got this under control. That's a relief. Between you and me, this basement gives me the willies. 
Heading for the stairs, Mr. Tolliver had hesitated and turned to Beck with a puzzled look. She grinned and gave him a peppy wave. With a shrug, he continued up the stairs, whistling a jaunty tune. You guys catch that? Sure did. This whole time Mr. Tolliver's had a candy shelf, but all he ever sells is his apples! Beck blinked slowly in disappointment. The password, Rolo. Well, sure, but once things are back to normal, I'll be having a word with Mr. Tolliver about that candy shelf. Fine. In the meantime, I've got an idea. She turned to the table and began tearing small scraps of paper. He said he heard a password on the radio. Any good spy transmission is never what it seems. Beck marked each scrap of paper and leaned back. We just need to find the hidden meaning. Okay. What's another word for underground? Buried? Covered? Could it be a cover-up? Maybe it's one of those each letter is a number thingies? So uh, U would be 21? N would be 14? D would be... Ooh! It's an anagram! Nuncreed's Drugstore. Luca and Beck looked at Rolo with amazement. Rolo, that was incredible. Well, it's either that or Kren's new drugstore. Yeah, I think you were right the first time. How'd you do that? What can I say? I love ciphers. Well, I guess we know where to go next. Revenge for the phone booth. You scared me half to death. Sorry. You kids haven't seen Mr. Tolliver around, have ya? Nope. He's got me waiting around like the last slice of, slice of pie. I swear, that man would be late to his own funeral. Glad to see the grown-ups have everything under control here. You're late, Augustus. Sorry, sister. I was caught up with work. Work? You? I had a few more details to lock down for the festival. Oh, what do you have to report? What is this insipid town festival really about? I think, Gus looked around nervously. I think Mr. Kerr really does just want to do something good for the town. He's actually a pretty nice guy. You should spend some time with him. I didn't pull strings installing you as mayor so that you can make friends. Your job is to help me figure out what Kerr and Perennial Harvest's true intentions are with this town. We have a responsibility. This is our father's town. Was. Excuse me? This was our father's town. He's gone, Eris, and he isn't coming back. Father left us with nothing but problems. Mr. Kirk came here and offered to help us. We accepted that help. We didn't agree to them turning father's warehouse into a toxic dumping ground. That's just a temporary arrangement. That glow can be seen from our damn backyard. They are dumping their nasty little secrets on us. When this all inevitably goes wrong, who do you think will be blamed? Eris's cry hung in the air. We have a new choice to make now, sister. This town is going to change whether we like it or not. Are we going to choose to be a part of that future or be forgotten in the past? It's a shame. Father named you Augustus, but you will always just be a... Gus. Good night, Eris. I'll see you at breakfast tomorrow. It's getting late, children. Ow. Knowledge, he spat with a sneer. There exists a gulf between knowing something and being able to do a damn thing about it. <laughs> I do hate it when the villain makes a good point. Oh, it's the little rich boy. Hello. Solomon stood proudly at the entrance to the drugstore, holding a brown bag overflowing with black licorice. Hey, Solomon. 
We're looking for Mr. Nuncreed. Is he still in there? I'm afraid not. Then where'd you get the candy from? You might say we have an arrangement. Solomon shoveled a surprising amount of licorice into his mouth. Sometimes it's the small pleasures in life. Though we might not always have family to rely on, licorice has never let me down. Well, I can't say licorice would be my first choice, but whatever floats your boat. You can tell a lot about a person by their choice of confection. I guess. I like sour gobs. I'm certain you do. I always wonder why Mr. Nuncreed kept licorice in stock. You must eat enough of it to make it worthwhile. There are many ways to earn loyalty. For some, it's as easy as cold hard cash. Well, he's right. It's locked. Bust a window. Bust. <laughs> There's gotta be more clues. Okay, let's see. Yes! Have you ever seen anyone actually use this thing? Besides Mr. Nuncreed, no. Beck cupped her hands on the glass to peek inside. That is not a normal phone booth. It's got like a blinky keypad. Why would there be a blinky keypad? Krenz, Nude, Rooks! <laughs> Underground secret! <laughs> Beck flung open the door and they all squeezed in. Alright, let's see here. Luca cracked his knuckles and entered the letters into the keypad. Underground secrets. That is a terrible password. Sounds like that did something. Great. Now what? I guess we... inside of the phone booth dropped loose from its shell. Without even the space to panic, they closed their eyes, held their breath, and accepted their fate. Ow. Suddenly, the chaotic descent slowed to an effortless landing. Why would you make it like that if it's an elevator? Why not just have it go smooth? It was unclear where they ended up, but at least it was on solid ground. It's a laundromat? I know it's not a laundromat. The air was stagnant and smelled vaguely of chlorine. I knew it! You knew there was a secret hub full of strange tubes under the phone booth? Of course I did. <laughs> Didn't I say that? No. I definitely thought it. Luca, do you remember when I said how cool it would be if the transdimensional conduits from Hank Atomic issue 12 were real? Rolo, at one point or another, you've said that about every technology ever discussed in Hank Atomic. That's why I'm such a good predictor. It looks like each of these has something written on them. Um, this suit has a broken mask. So we found our mystery warehouse creeper. We've at least found their hazmat suit. If it walks like a nuncreed and talks like a nuncreed, let's not jump to conclusions. Just saying. Mining operations alpha. You guys have mines here? Not that I know of. This town has all farms and fertilizer. And a series of tubes. Paul always says you can only trust a miner up to the point when they hit gold. Not sure how that wisdom applies in this exact situation. That's the thing about Pa. You don't always realize what he means until it's too late. Perennial Harvest Main Office. Uh, that's where my mom works. What does she do? Science stuff? Is she involved in all of this? We just moved here. How could she be involved? True. Valentine Fertilizer Warehouse. Isn't that where you almost got snatched? Yeah. Why would Perennial Harvest have a tube going to the old Valentine place? This is starting to feel like something big. 
That's a lot of buttons. Stand aside, Earthlings. I've read enough Hank Atomic to know my way around sci-fi tech. Rolo's hands hovered over the field of blinking buttons. Eeny, meeny, miny. Rolo, what did you do? Nothing! I didn't even mow yet! What was that? Hide! Where? There's nothing but weird tubes! Just get back! <laughs> Shit. 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 Awesome! Well, don't move to let him aside. You all need to come with me now. We aren't going anywhere with you. Not until we get some answers. Mr. Underground Secrets. I told them it was an absurd password. But they love anything that makes them feel clever. They who? That's no matter. If I can keep you hidden until after the festival, I might be able to save your skins. We don't care about our skins. Hold on now, I like my skin. This all stops now, Nuncreed. Joseph waited a moment in silence. You sound just like him. Who? Walt. You don't get to talk about my dad. You know, your father and I were friends back before. He gestured toward the strange tubes. All of this. That's a lie. It's true. I used to bounce you on my knee. Nope. What happened? Same thing that always happens. Reality. Complications. Life. We were a team, Walt and I. An idealistic doctor and a bright-eyed pharmacist. Oh, hell bent on helping folk. So you were a sidekick? No. We were partners. I don't know why it helps my voice to go deep when I do a southern accent. <laughs> he helped the patients and I helped him. Yep, total sidekick. Then Creed let out a growl of a sigh. Luca? I need you to know this. I need someone to know this. One day, Shopper Valentine comes to us, says he's got an opportunity. He'd found something he didn't quite understand, and he was willing to pay us both handsomely to help him understand it. And my dad said no. Your father and I both believed in helping people. But the thing I could never get him to understand was it's a lot easier to help others if you help yourself now and then. Classic sidekick into villain plotline. Walt loved being righteous. Almost more than he loved his family. <laughs> he was wrong about one thing, though. When he begged me not to take Valentine's offer, he said, Joseph, if a person says yes one time to shop a Valentine, he'll make sure they keep on saying yes to him until the day he's dead and gone. He shook his head wistfully. Shop was long gone, but he still got me saying yes. Is there a point to this stop story? Not really, no. Just an old man trying to delay what needs doing. Nuncree took a menacing step toward the children. I tried to keep you safe. I tried to keep you and Juniper out of this. But you forced my hand. Luca began to laugh. What? You really don't know? My grand isn't out of this. She's been scheming right under your nose. Juniper? Seems like she's planning on crashing the town's party. She's going to disrupt the festival. Why would she? The color drained from Nuncreed's face. How does she know? 
Apparently she knows a lot of things. What? Let's just say this isn't the only underground layer we've busted into today. And honestly, hers is way cooler. She's got maps and explosive explosives and bad, bad intentions, big man. Nuncreed grabbed Luca by the shoulders. His eyes were frantic. You need to tell me what she's going to do right now. She doesn't understand. <laughs> she doesn't understand what it is she's mess messing with. Oh. Tell me now. She's in danger, boy. I don't know. She had a map of the mark on the fountain in the town square. The fountain? Well, why would... A jolt of realization struck Mr. Nuncreed. She knows about the source. What the heck is the source? If she tries to destroy the source, it could catalyze, and dear God, she's going to freeze us all. You all need to run. Run where? Away. As far away from this town as you can get. Head west and don't look back. That did not go how I expected. So, we're totally following him, right? Totally. See you on the other side. You good? Yep. I love this town. Chapter 8, The Cold Hard Truth. Are we going to finish this game tonight? Maybe. Beck leapt up, allowing the suction to yank her into the dark. Dimness eclipsed around her like the shutter of a camera as she seemed to cover great distance in mere moments. Her only points of reference were glints of upcoming turns, which approached with frightening speed, only to caram her gracefully along. She heard the tinny, distant echoes of Rolo's glee. When she stopped fighting against it, the ride was impossibly smooth. Then, all of a sudden, I wonder what language this was written in. I think it's been translated. As if minutes had passed in an instant, life blazed into view. A burst of wintry air snuffed across her face, and she was flung out into the cold. Oh, it's like home. That was... Intense? Yeah. I think I might have parted with some fluids in there. Any idea where we are? Somewhere cold? Doesn't look like it got on any of us. Didn't feel like we traveled that far. So where did it all go? This place sucks. Why would anyone even want to blow something up out here? Only one way to find out, I suppose. We gotta catch up to Nuncreed. I think he went this way. Can I investigate the fact that Rolo apparently shit himself? <laughs> but what's this way? Hello? Hello? I mean, this is just Beacon Pines. Yep. This looks familiar, yeah. Maybe we can clear out the snow. No time, Nuncrete's getting away. Oh, we're in a nuclear wasteland, that's nice. Okay, this is starting to feel really familiar. I may not be the most well-versed on all things Beacon Pines, but this does look like some sort of frozen rec replica of town. I got it! It's so obvious now. Mr. Nuncreet is an alien. Rolo, stick with me here. His species can only live in sub-zero temperatures. Oh boy, here we go. The source is their base camp dimension, so naturally they keep it cold. We found it by traveling through those metallic wormholes back there. The final objective, kill us all and shake, shift into a beacon pine citizen of their choosing. You never really had me, but you very much lost me there. You get used to it. We should keep moving.
As they rounded the corner to the frozen town square, they spotted Mr. Nuncreed inching cautiously toward a pit at its center. He held his arms out gingerly, as if approaching a beast in the wild. Upon closing the distance, Luca recognized what Nuncreed was after. Grand stood confidently at the edge, one arm outstretched over the abyss. Nearby, a wheelbarrow had been emptied out. She held a lit torch, which flickered in the bitter wind. Juniper, I don't know what you think you're doing, but I assure you this is not going to solve anything. You drop that, you've doomed this whole town. Oh, it wasn't me who doomed this town. I have been watching you, Joseph. I know what you've done. You and your co-conspirators. Gran? What's happening? Luca, you and your friends need to leave right this moment. Mr. Nuncreed turned back toward the kids, desperation in his eyes. Listen to your grandma, Luca. This is between me and Juniper. Rollo and Beck held steadfast in awe. Luca approached closer. Mr. Nuncreed spun back toward Gran, his voice growing louder. You've got it all wrong, Juniper. Just hand over that torch. You don't understand what you're doing. How could I possibly trust you to do the right thing? Walt told me everything. He trusted you, and you betrayed that trust. Luca, did you know that this man's entire life is a lie? If it weren't for him, your father might still be alive. Mr. Nuncreed winced with anguish. His voice hardened. That's not true. They both now yelled, not to each other, but at fate itself, making their peace with long-held burdens. The wind howled with encouragement. Walt was like a brother to me. We just had different ideas on how to effect change. Very convenient that your way just happened to line your pockets. Now that's not fair. Is this his mom pretending to be her mom the whole time? Oh my god. They menaced at each other, both catching their breath. The moment balanced on a knife's edge. Amid a blur of emotions and memories, Luca's mind flooded with questions. The wind calmed as if to give him the stage, and in the stillness, he began to weep. It was all just too much. Falling to his knees, Luca whimpered softly. The tears crystallized as they hit the snow. Graham stared at Luca for a moment with sympathy. Remembering why this was all necessary. This will all make sense soon, Luca. And everything can go back to normal. I promise. She stiffened up and brandished the torch at Mr. Nuncreed. You can't hide behind those people any longer, Joseph. Once their precious source is destroyed, we'll see where their loyalties fall. Juniper, don't. Ignoring his final plea, Gran flung the torch into the deep darkness. She smiled and exhaled in relief. Mr. Nuncreed moaned in resignation. The torch echoed as it ricocheted down the hole, punctuated with a thunderous thud. You see, Joseph, I've learned one very important lesson in life. If you want things to change, then you must be willing to. Before Grand could finish, the ground shook her to silence, and then they all froze, and we have to find another thing, I guess. Gran only had time to spin around and run to Luca, her attempt to shield him, an honorable but trifling act. Unflinching love pitted against an unthinking horror. There was no contest. Her warm embrace froze in an instant. That is where they remain, fixed in place. Forever. And so our story ends on this melancholy scene. In a town brought low by its secrets sits the frozen statues of a misguided band of meddlers. The end. Well... That was dire. On the bright side, we finally figured out where all the ice is coming from. Now we just need to find a way to deal with a mystic, unfathomable for force of nature. Okay. So we can't weep, obviously. Um, okay, so we're back the clones. Luca drew himself up and decided to take the only option they had left. Flight. He squinted down the barrel of the mission control defense cannon, 
aiming it through an open in the dense tree branch. He looked up with surprise that it struck true and taut. Wow, I can't believe that worked. Hey, Mr. Kerr, we'd love to hear your thoughts, but I'm afraid we have places to be. Come on, Iggy. See ya, jerks. Fine, we know where that leads them. This way, we'll take the tunnels. Luca and Iggy winced as they sprinted through the thicket. The branches clawed at them, reluctant to give passage. After what felt like a marathon, Luca stopped in his tracks as they reached a clearing. What the? That was all he was able to say before Iggy slammed into his back. The boys tumbled down a steep decline and crashed with a wheezing thud on a surface as hard as ice. In fact, it was ice. You know that feeling when you just like zip line into another dimension? Chapter 5. Signs. They stood silently, catching their breath. The sky was like sapphire. With each breath, a plume of steam escaped from Luca's lungs. Let's keep moving. Luca pulled Iggy to his feet, and they gazed across the snowy terrain. Good thing he's in a parka. That was actually pretty badass. Uh-huh. I think we lost him. Are we up in the mountains? I don't think so. If anything, we went downhill. Then <laughs> what's up with the Winter Wonderland? All I know is there's no going back the way we came. Let's see if we can get our bearings. Follow me. A disk of smooth metal was lightly covered in snow. Two faint seams were visible along the surface. A manhole cover? If it is, I've never seen one like it. What's the readout? Sitting just above 258 degrees Kelvin. That's down a bit from last time. Should we report this to Mr. Kerr? Eh, still within safe ranges. It may be spreading, but it's under control for now. Even a small nudge in the equilibrium could cause a cascade. Dude, relax. Just a few more sights today before we can punch out. Let's get this over with. What's all this? Hard to say with all the snow. I think it's a town sign. I can almost make out letters under the... What town could this even be? There couldn't be another town this deep into Weepwood. I'm looking at evidence to the contrary. Let's figure out what we're dealing with here. Step one, snow's gotta go. I'll see what I can do. Shit. <laughs> Game, you can't expect me to aim things. I don't know what else to tell you. The boys stared in disbelief at the sign that now clearly read, Welcome to Beacon Pines. This doesn't make any sense. We're in Beacon Pines? How is that possible? We ran away from town. How did we get back here? I guess we got turned around? Where did all the snow come from? Well, it's been colder than normal lately. There's a pretty big difference between sweater weather and this arctic hellscape. The puddle we fought at before, it was cold too. Maybe all of it leads to one source. You think it's related? What the hell is going on? We're gonna get you some answers. Let's keep moving. Luca? Luca, are you there? Luca had almost forgotten the walkie-talkie he was carrying. It's up Bozo Kerr. I hope nothing bad has happened to you out there in those woods. Luca looked at Iggy with hesitation. No need to be rude. With a resigned sigh, Luca responded. Seems like the only dangerous thing in the woods is you. He speaks the young man of the hour. Now, how in tarnation did you end up with one of our radios? Just lucky, I guess. Boy, how do you Van Horns are full of surprises, aren't you? You knew my parents? I never had the honor of meeting your father, but your mom sure was a handful. Luca winced, shoving the walkie-talkie back into his pocket. We gotta keep moving. The fencing glistened, each chain link encapsulated with a translucent layer of ice. Looks like the stuff they put up around Weep Wood. The stuff who put up? I don't know. It's all frozen. 
Looking down at the frozen stream, Luca could faintly see a school of minnows encased in the ice. Whatever happened here, it happened fast. The fish didn't even have time to run. Or, you know, swim, run. The crunching of footsteps trailing Luca went hush. They looked back to see Iggy's face twisted with confusion. Everyone's gone. What? There's nothing here but more snow. There must be an explanation for all of this. We have to keep looking. You can look all you want. I quit. Iggy, we have to keep going. You don't get it, do you? This isn't one of your pathetic Hank Atomic stories. We aren't going to save the day. We aren't even going to save ourselves. My face is mangled. The town is destroyed and everyone we've ever known is gone. We don't know that. You can't just quit. Do whatever you want. I'm done. Iggy, it's gonna be okay. Luca peered upward at the darkening sky. He let out a long, foggy breath. Faintly, Iggy began to cry. Seeing Iggy in such a pathetic state gave Luca a sense of compassion and more than a little guilt. It is getting pretty late, I think. Probably not a great idea to stumble around in the dark anyway. Luca allowed himself to collapse next to Iggy. Let's just rest for a bit. The boys huddled together for warmth and comfort. If not for exhaustion, their minds would be racing, trying to make sense of the events of the day. As it was, all they had energy to, for was to sit in silence, numb. The way the snow covered everything over, it's kind of calming. Yeah, I haven't had time to say it, but thanks. Huh? For getting us away from those creeps. I sort of froze up back there. Iggy, I should be the one apologizing. This all happened because I lost my temper. Nah, that's bull hockey. First of all, you didn't know what the gunk would do. You didn't, right? Of course not. And second, stop with this baloney about losing your temper. But I did lose my temper. Iggy motioned sarcastically to his half-deformed face. Obviously. But that's exactly what you should have done. Huh? I was being a horse's ass. You were supposed to be a horse's ass in response. That's how it works. Iggy, I'm having a hard time following. You wanted me to fight you? Of course. Jeez, you goody-goody types take forever to understand this very basic point. Why would you go around saying cruel things trying to get into fights? Iggy shrugged. Something to do. You're an asshole because you're bored? Sometimes I just feel empty. You wouldn't understand. You and Roller are always having a blast together. Laughing and calling that dinky little treehouse mission control. Iggy now wept openly. <laughs> perfect little Luca Van Horn with his perfect little life. My life is not perfect. Everybody in town likes you. Not everybody. <laughs> that new girl hasn't even unpacked yet and she already likes you. You have Tish. He wiped his nose with his sleeve. I love Tish. Tish is great, but she ain't exactly the world's greatest conversationalist, you know? Luca gave a warm chuckle. I get that impression. Iggy cleared his throat as he wiped his eyes. <laughs> Must be raining out here. Definitely. Iggy arched into a wide yawn. We should probably try to get some sleep. Yeah. Let's sleep low for now. Tomorrow we'll get to the bottom of all this. Luca's eyelids began to slowly drift shut. Luca? Yeah? I always did want to see the inside of your dinky little tree house. What do you think? Not bad. I'll give you the full tour when we get back. You know what? That's all Luca could whisper before succumbing to sleep. Aki snuggled in some more. When it comes to worst days of my entire life, this one wasn't half bad. The house smelled of warm bread. Luca was playing with toy blocks on the living room rug. He looked up to see his parents on the couch. His mother held his father's head in her lap. She idly stroked his hair while humming a song. A voice behind Luca spoke. This is how you remember them, huh? Luca turned to see his own face. The doppelganger from his dreams, still clad in a yellow hazmat suit, still carrying a look of disdain behind empty eyes. Aw, 
Look at this perfectly cozy scene. You know it wasn't really like this. The figure picked up a toy block and inspected it. It's amazing the facades that one can build given the right materials. Not that I blame us. These are a child's memories. All warm and fuzzy. You don't remember, do you? Lucas snatched the block from the figure's yellow-gloved hand. Remember what? The doppelganger pointed to the couch. The last day we saw him alive. The day he chose to abandon us. Luca turned to look at his father, still lounging on the couch. That's not true. He didn't abandon us. The doppelganger waved his hand dismissively. Everything is true here. It's just a matter of what we choose to see. Let me show you. The world flickered and pulsed. Luca was sitting next to his bed, listening to his heartbeat with one of his dad's stethoscopes. The doppelganger limped into the room. Now, now, we both know that's not how this went. He grabbed Luca's hand and guided the stethoscope to the floor. Luca heard muffled shouting brought close by the stethoscope. It was his parents, biting. Do you remember what we did next? Luca gave a slow nod and crept down the hall to peek through the banister. He could see the outline of his mother at the bottom of the stairs. Damn it, Walt, we can't afford to get involved in this. She was scared. His father stepped forward. What am I supposed to do? Just watch? There's a sickness in this town and we both know who's behind it. I swore an oath to help people. I won't turn my back on them. Luca's mother grabbed Walt. She was crying, pleading. I can't lose you. Walt calmly removed Eleanor's hand from his shoulder. What's right is right, and what's wrong is wrong. I could never live with myself if I let Sharper get away with this. Eleanor raised her voice. Spare me your bullshit platitudes. What about our son? Luca flinched, dropping the stethoscope down the stairs. Walt turned with a panicked smile. Luca, is that you, buddy? With tears in his eyes, Luca descended the stairs. Mom, Dad, what's going on? Walt dropped to a knee to meet Luca eye to eye. Nothing, buckaroo. Your mom and I just got a little overexcited is all. Luca placed the stethoscope against his father's chest. His heart was racing. It sounded like you were going somewhere. Walt gently removed the device from Luca's ears. Listen to me, Luca. I have some business to take care of. I'll be back in time to tuck you in. Luca hugged his father tightly. Promise? Walt stood up and walked to the door. He glanced over his shoulder. I promise. With a wink and a grin, he put on his hat and strode out into the evening sun. A figure approached soundlessly from the foggy snowfall. It stood above them, lingering in contemplation. Slowly raising one hand above Ivy, it snapped out two brisk wraps on his head. From a deep slumber, Iggy sprang up defensively. Get your hands off me! Whether it was the calm presence or the recognition that he was not in danger, Iggy felt his clenched fist lower. Just what do you think you're doing? Luca looked up, gradually remembering his whereabouts. The figure exhaled a cloud of warm vapor. You two certainly have caused a lot of commotion. What's that supposed to mean? Take it easy, Iggy. We were asleep minding our own business. You're the one running around knocking on people's heads. I'm sorry if I hurt you, Iggy. You didn't hurt nobody. Anybody. Huh? Oh, I see. You think you're better than me, you- When it came to complete strangers, Iggy had trouble cobbling together an insult. You big-hatted, scarfy-necked- Furball? Hmm? Okay, let's lower the temperature a bit here. Interesting choice of words. I mean, let's all just calm down. Who are you? A friend. An observer. A hitchhiker on the infinite expanse of possibility. Great. How about a name? If you must call me something, you can call me Nat. Iggy huffed with gratification. How you make like a gnat and buzz off. Very well. Nat began to turn away indifferently. Wait! Do you live here? You might say that. So you know where we are? You might also say that. Look, pal, we just want to find a safe way out of here. Are you going to help us or not? Before knowing how to leave, one must know where they are. Alright, that does it. 
Luca, I don't know about you, but I'm getting out of here one way or another. Iggy turned sharply and began to stomp off. Enough with the riddles. Iggy, wait up. Realizing he'd worn their patience thin, Nat relented. Very well, I suppose this isn't the time for metaphors. I'll show you how to get back home. Luca and Iggy turned around with hope in their eyes. Come here. Nat took a deep breath in. Close your eyes. Nat exhaled slowly, then snapped his fingers. Okay, open them. For a brief moment, Luca and Iggy let themselves believe that some great magic was about to unfold. Until they opened their eyes and found themselves in the exact same place. Cold and disheartened. This is your home. This is Beacon Pines. Look, Nat, we don't know how we got here. Maybe we stumbled through some time travel gate in Weepwood, or we teleported to some alternate universe, or this is all just some cruel experiment by Kurt and his goons. But this is not our home. You're inching closer to the truth. Alas, the reality is much less fanciful. Just give it to us straight. So be it. As I said, this is Beacon Pines. The original, true Beacon Pines. Alternate dimension? You both grew up here, but the town you've called your home for the past several years is a replica. A remarkable achievement of engineering, to be fair, but a replica nonetheless. That's impossible. It's too much work. You'd need a whole town to replicate a whole town. Indeed. To pull off such a feat would require immense labor power. That which could be moved would be moved. That which could not would require a precise duplicate. We would have noticed. Someone would have noticed. You'd think so, unless the auditing was impeccable. A mind-numbing attention to detail. As for the innumerable trivi trivialities which complete the tapestry, well, you can leave that to this miraculous thing we call a brain. It has a real aversion to discontinuity. A revulsion, even. The brain has a wonderful way of smoothing out the rough edges, keeping us sane. Luca and Iggy looked around uncomfortably. So you're saying that someone made an entire new town and moved us all and no one noticed? Precisely. Why? Why is the one question that can never be answered with certainty. The best one can do is to uncover. Nat narrowed his eyes, furrowed his brow, and uttered, The source. Why'd you say the source like that? Why indeed? Luca began to laugh uncomfortably. <laughs> it's all ridiculous. There's no way they could... He looked down at his feet. His eyes darted back and forth in contemplation. With a sudden pain, a thought struck him. If this really is home... He sprinted off into the pale distance. As Iggy turned to follow, Nat called out, Iggy, it's not too late to turn back. Simply head west through Weepwood. Now I'm just going to have to keep reading and keep reading until it's done. Chapter 6. The Source. Nat expressed his sympathy with a shrug and sauntered off as unassumingly as he'd arrived. He'd given Luca and Iggy what they needed, and nothing more. As Luca sprinted across the snow, the events of the past few days became clearer. Pieces to a larger puzzle. Rolo said he was underground somewhere. Captured. Mr. Kerr tried to cover it up with lies. The clipboards were hellbent on capturing Iggy, and were identical for some reason. It all seemed to point, point to perennial harvest. But right now, there was one thing that Luca needed to know. Oh, this is gonna hurt. Luca stopped dead in his tracks. The tree was gone, uprooted and moved, leaving a raw gash in the earth. He dropped to his knees and dug wildly at the cold snow. His numb hands hit something hard. A headstone. A dry whisper escaped Luca's lips. You're here. All this time I thought I was visiting you. But you've been here. Alone. In the snow. Dad, I'm so sorry. They ruined your favorite spot in the world. Our favorite spot in the world. Dad. What do I do? There was no reply, just snow-covered silence. Why'd you give me the slip like that? What if I couldn't find you, you jerk? 
Iggy finally noticed the tears welling in Luca's eyes and the snow-covered grave. Oh. Iggy, they... They stole his tree, Iggy. Yikes. Suddenly, they heard the crunch of approaching footsteps in the snow. We gotta hide! 259k. Fall off distance, still good. Dude, did you hear me? I said 259. Sorry. You ever think about what we did here? We saved a whole town of people. Doesn't feel like it sometimes. What about everything we left behind? That's the grave of someone with a family. The people who loved him will never know the truth. The truth is overrated. He bent down to scoop up a snowball and lobbed it playfully. Hey, don't be such a downer, dude. We took this job to change the world. Yeah. Come on. It's almost lunchtime. <coughs> Weirdo. Did not expect. Literally dancing on graves. Here I thought I was a jerk. These dinguses are literally dancing on graves. He gets it. He gets it. Luca stuttered through heaving sobs. <laughs> I thought I was visiting him. I thought he was with me. Not gonna lie. That's a bad break. Here's some advice. Iggy gave Luca a small smack on the back of his head. Hey! Who's any of this helping? What? Sitting here in the snow, crying like some pushover. Who you helping? Iggy, look what they did. They lied to everyone. Blah, blah, blah. Luca Van Horn, you're a lot of things, but you ain't no pushover. What did I tell you before? When some jerk comes at you acting like a horse's ass, I should stand up for myself. Hell yeah! Karen, Kurt and his merry little band of clipboards pull off his switcheroo for a reason, right? Not mention something about a source? Luca wiped his eyes with his sleeve. Whatever that the source must be awfully valuable to perennial harvest. Sure would be a shame if something unfortunate were to happen to their precious source, wouldn't it? What do you have in mind? If it's small enough to steal, we snatch it. If it's too big to snatch, we smash it. And what if it's too big to smash? Iggy flashed a mischievous smile and cracked his knuckles. I'm always up for a challenge. I'm gonna make this right, Dad. I promise. Let's do this. Oh, fuck yeah. Okay, so we need to go... It can get awful cold out there in those woods, Luca. Probably best you two stay put and conserve your energy. Help's on the way. Where's Rolo? Where's my mom? Did you kill her? Oh, heavens no. Do I seem like a killer to you? Iggy and Luca shared a skeptical look. Well, do I? Aw, shucks. Now that hurts my feelings. Screw that guy. Wait, shit, did I miss something? Wait a minute. If this is the original town, then that means... Iggy darted behind a large pine and began digging furiously. He emerged holding a shoebox with a crude skull painted on his lid. Is it explosives? Oh, fuck yes. What's that? Long story. So a few years back, I, uh, came into possession of some premium grade fireworks? Not the wimpy firecracker stuff they give kids. The good stuff. So why'd you bury it under a tree? That's the long part of the story. You and Rolo were doing chores at Rolo's chicken coop and you guys pissed me off for some reason or another. Luca rolled his eyes with realization. No, you didn't. Iggy sighed with a chuckle. <laughs> yep. Just wanted to give you guys a little scare, but like I said, these were some primo fireworks. So I might have underestimated things. You blew up the chicken coop? I prefer to think of it as an incendiary redecoration. Sorry, but you should have seen the looks on your faces. Rollo got grounded for months, which is why I needed to stash the evidence and lay low. So I buried him under that tree. But when I came back for him later, they were gone. I figured some grown-up found him and tossed him. Iggy triumphantly raised the shoebox. Turns out it wasn't the fireworks that got moved. It was us. Unbelievable. Do you think this is the game? News flash boyo, you're not a hero. 
You're a little brat who's in way over his head. A hero is just someone who refuses to give up. Comics these days are rotting children's brains. Everyone thinks they're a spaceman superhero. I was always partial to Hank Atomic myself. Is that so? Do you really think you have a chance against us? You have no idea how powerful we are. Prepare for blast off, loser. Luca and Iggy inched up to the edge of the hole with bewilderment in their eyes. Arctic air breathed out of the cavern in heaving gusts. Echo! 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 Whoa. I can see why they wanted to move us out of town now. But why would they dig a giant hole? I think this is it. This is the source? It's a dang hole? How do we smash a hole? Oh, it's much more than that, my annoying little friend. Kerr, where's Rolo? I wasn't lying before, he's safe. Well, safer than you two, at least. Drats, it's cold. You just had to drag me all the way out here, didn't you? Mr. Kerr gazed down at the abyss in contemplation. It really is something, isn't it? What did you do to our town? What is all of this? Well, that's a doozy of a question. This is the source where they collect the unrefined, uh, Kerr scratched the back of his head. Honestly, boys, I don't understand any of this well enough to explain it. Fact of the matter is I'm not paid to know. What do you mean you don't know? Ain't you in charge? Oh, heavens no. My role is merely to flash a winning smile and manage various complications. Complications like us? You are a smart boy. His face contorted into a sat saturine grin. It really is nothing personal. Some people are destined to strive for greatness and others are simply obstacles along the way. Seems like you were destined to be a creepy lackey. The point is that we all play our part in life. Mine just happened to be a lead in the role of a lifetime. And you happen to be extras ready for your curtain call. We aren't giving up without fight. Your smile's not going to be so winning after we're done with you. Now, boys, there's no need for melodrama. It makes even a professional such as myself embarrassed for you. Let's change the mood a bit. Kerr snapped his fingers. Scene change! There. Yeah, that's better. The scene has not changed, you dumb fuck. Deal with them. Iggy turned to Luca with a sly glance. Why are you smirking? Cause I have a box full of fireworks and you don't. Iggy waved the box into the air, threatening to drop it down the hole. Stop! Let's not do something regrettable. Joke's on you. Regret is one of my specialties. Out of curiosity, what would happen if I threw these in your precious hole? Nothing. Nothing at all. You're a terrible liar. I'll have you know I'm an exceptional liar. That's far enough. Iggy plucked a single bottle rocket from the box and held it up with reverence. Stop, you fool. Call off your goons. After a long pause, Mr. Kerr flung up his hand with frustration. Very well. You all can head back for the night. It's been a long day. I'll handle these two from here. Mr. Kerr sighed into the frigid air. It's just us now, Iggy. You can put them down. What, like this? With a nonchalant flick, he tossed the firework into the hole. I mean, if it's not lit, it wouldn't really do anything. Ooh. Whoa. With a growl, Kerr leapt at Iggy, crashing through Luca. Iggy tried to twist away, but in the struggle, they both tumbled over the side. Luca dove forward, bracing Iggy's hand just before it slipped. 
His grip was made precarious by the cold, wet snow. He could see Kerr further down, clinging to Iggy's coat. You reckless child, what have you done? Luca, listen to me. Hold on tight and use the walkie-talkie to call them back. How... What channel do I use? Doesn't make a damn difference, they're always listening. If you do that, the clipboards will just hollow us up and snag us both. The only way you get out of this is if Kerr is out of the picture. Let go and save yourself. If he lets go, we both die. I don't want to die, but seeing the look on your face almost makes it worth it. Mr. Kerr, you've had a long life. Why don't you actually do something selfless and just let go? Mr. Kerr gasped with insult. Long life? I'll have you know I can still play 25. You should have heard me sing the start of Phileas Young. With a wild look in his eye, Mr. Kerr began to hum a proud melody. <laughs> wow. Can you believe this guy? Luca's hand began to cramp. His voice began to crack. Kerr, just let go. No can do. If you want to save your friend, you'll have to save me too. Luca, look at me. It's okay. Luca felt Iggy loosen his grasp. You aren't going to kill your friend like that, are you? Every muscle in Luca's body burned. I'm not his friend. Yes, you are. Nah, I'm just a no-good bully. Like you, Kerr. Iggy, no. Luca felt his hand slipping. And I told you what you need to do with bullies. I can't. It's the only way out of this mess. Two birds with one stone. Makes sense for us to fall together. Wackadoos travel in packs. A calm settled over Iggy's face. Luca, let me do this. Iggy's voice was colder than the bitter air billowing from the chasm. Let me do the right thing for once. Luca had no choice but to... Oh no, oh god, don't make me do this. That's a child. I can't kill a child. He tightened his grip and reached for the walkie-talkie in his pocket. A wild delight kept on in Mr. Kerr's face. That's a good lad. No radio for help. Iggy begged Lucas with his eyes one last time, but Iggy pressed the button and called out. We need help. Mr. Kerr is in danger. It wasn't long before they were once again surrounded by clipboards. Mr. Kerr sighed. There you are. You really are a worthless lot, aren't you? Mirror now. A clipboard dutifully pull produce an ornate hand mirror. Mr. Kerr began preening at his tussle there. Ah, that's better. Mr. Van Horn, I applaud your sharp thinking under duress. I'll put in a good word for you with the founder. Take them away. A swarm of hands overpowered Luca. The last thing he saw before a cloth bag was pulled over his head was a defeated look on Iggy's face. Oh, come on, you can't ask me. For doing the right thing was the wrong thing. I don't want to kill a kid. Jesus, fuck. I'm going to cry. I don't like this. With a quiet blink, Luca watched a teardrop sail down into the howling void. As his finger slowly gave up, he met his eyes with a good. Well, now I'm crying on stream again, so that's fun. The two silhouettes were swallowed by darkness. <laughs> I like the idea that he was just like armed with explosives <laughs> and apparently detonators. Got my eyes. Hell of a goodbye, Iggy. <laughs> Luca, you should really step back. What? Quickly. Curious. Ah, but of course. Those fireworks of Iggy's must have been just the right amount of energy. We should get out of here before perennial harvest arrives. Not until you tell me which has happened. Your friend sacrificed to save this town. For a little while, anyway. How? Tempest liquamine is a peculiar substance. It can change the relationship between matter and time itself. 
but doing so requires unfathomable energy. In a closed system, that energy can only come from its surroundings. A useful side product of this property being, by adding precisely the correct amount of energy to it, one can create a cryogenic cascade. So the gunk makes things cold and the fireworks made the hole freeze over. That's one way of putting it, yes. As dumb luck would have it, the fireworks weren't strong enough to generate a runaway reaction. I shudder to think what would have happened in that case. We have some idea what that would look like. It will take them a good while to safely break through and access the source again. If you know all of this stuff, why haven't you been helping? I have been. In my way. Each one of us has a role to play. Iggy's role, it turns out, was to buy us precious time. Mine has been to observe and wait. Wait for what? You. Me? Why? What's my role? A fierce twinkle flashed in Nat's eyes. Luca Van Horn, you are going to save the world. With a chuckle, Nat turned and walked west. Dumbfounded, Luca followed behind him, trudging through the snow. Every step taking further him further away from everyone and everything he knew, and closer to destiny. To be continued in, Beacon Pines 2. Pines harder. Revenge served cold. Second time's a charm. Wait, that's it? This ends with a crowing cliffhanger? Just when I was getting good? I was even starting to like Iggy. No way. I refuse to be associated with some never-ending Pareto sequels. Let's go back and find something more definitive. Honestly, what's left? I don't know. Oh, okay, we're gonna hum at this confrontation. After the death of his father, Luca had trouble sleeping. Each night, his mother would sit at the foot of his bed and hum a gentle melody. It was the only thing that could calm his mind. The only thing that, however briefly, could make it all seem okay. That melody pervaded every mel Ugh. that melody pervaded every memory Luca had of his mother. Shivering in the raw snow, he began to hum it out loud. Oh no, now I am gonna cry. <laughs> Gran lowered the torch, listening closely. As recognition slowly set in, her heart sank. Those countless nights of consolation, the incomparable loss they shared together. She let the torch fall to the snow and sizzle out. She is his mom, that's fucking horrible. A few steps, steps toward Luca was all she could bear before dropping to the snow herself. Through a flood of tears, she began to hum along, note for note. How do you abandon your son by pretending to be his grandmother? That's insane. Luca lifted his head in astonishment. The last time he heard that melody was the last night he saw his mother. How do you know? I'm so sorry, my little buckaroo. Buckaroo? The only people who call, that, call me that are my dad and your mother. Luca blinked through blurry, watery eyes, trying to see more clearly. He could just make out the impression of a familiar face. He peered across the snowscape at the woman on her knees. Something about her was undeniably his mother. Only smaller. Older. Changed? Mom? That's right, buckaroo. Mom! Luca sprinted as fast as he could toward his mother. They held each other close, and the cold retreated from their bodies. Eleanor? I thought you were... Gone? I should have known I would never abandon my son. Eleanor looked down at Luca, tightening her embrace in an appeal for forgiveness. How? You're a smart man, Joseph. I thought you'd have pieced it together by now. You... you were exposed. Mom, I don't understand any of this. What happened to you? Where did you go? Why did you leave me? I never left you. I was always right here, Luca. Why did you lie to me? It tore me up, Luca, but I did it to keep you safe. I thought that getting answers would help us both move on. 
but the more I discovered, the more I realized the danger we were in. Until perennial harvest was stopped, it was better if everyone thought I was gone. You could have trusted me. These are bad people, Luca. They won't stop until they get what they want. They don't care who gets hurt in the process. Then what do we do? We have to stop them. Joseph slumped into the cold, wet snow. They can't be stopped. This is too big. I tried beating them at their own game. I'm done fighting fire with fire. For the first time in a long time, her voice felt like her own again. No more lies. I see now there's a better way to stop perennial harvest. The cold, hard truth. Luca gazed down at Nuncreed with pity. He looked small. Joseph stared into the snow as if searching it for answers. Come on, everyone. We've got a party to crash. I don't understand if she was aged by this cryogenic. No, because cryogenic would just freeze time. But that would make it less insane for her to pretend to be his grandma if she actually was super aged up. You don't understand. He always wins. Chapter 9. The Devil You Know. Seven months ago, Eleanor Van Horn crept down the maze of sterile hallways under perennial harvest. She stopped in front of the large steel door marked Deep Engineering. No turning back now. She raised a trembling hand. The stolen keycard worked as promised, and the door buzzed open with mechanical efficiency. She was immediately hit with the smell of disinfectant. Is this motherfucker, the founder of the town, reincarnated in that annoying licorice-loving boy? It was some sort of laboratory. In one corner was a desk covered in papers. Across the room stood a tall metal pod with hoses protruding from its base. She rushed to the desk and began shifting through piles of papers. They were experiment reports on something called Tempest, Li Tempest Liquamine. There were dozens of them. Everyone stamped failed. Eleanor heard the sharp echo of footsteps approaching. She was out of time. Her eyes scanned the room, eventually landing on the strange pod. Muttering a curse under her breath, she dashed over and dove inside. Well, that's a fucking stupid idea. And that is what change is all about. Grabbing future by the scruff of the neck and making things happen. Change is a choice. I am tickled pink that we will all be making that choice together. How great is that? This man is a liar. Excuse me? I will not. This town has a dangerous secret and perennial harvest only exists to keep it hidden. Nonsense. They picked up the whole damn town and moved it right under our noses. You aren't making any sense, dear. Mr. Kerr addressed the crowd with a sarcastic tone. Imagine such a thing. It's absurd and just plain impossible. They promised they could fix the foul harvest. They told us they would clean this place up. We just had to leave town for a few days. But while they had us evacuated... Mrs. Hartford, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to... You're afraid of a lot of things, aren't you? You sniveling little worm. This is growing tiresome. A little help, please. Don't you all see? This festival is a sham. An excuse to have the whole town gather in one place. They're planning something awful. I don't know what, but these people are wicked. Don't listen to her. She has absolutely no proof. I am the proof. I'm Eleanor Van Horn. Whispers filtered through the crowd. Well, aren't you just sneaky as the dickens? We all knew Valentine's fertilizer was too good to be true. And now this whole town is paying the price. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so sorry about this disruption. My associates will take this obviously disturbed woman somewhere comfortable. So that she can get the help she needs. She's not the one who's disturbed. You two Tom and Clown. You all know there's something wrong with this town. It was just easier to look the other way. The truth is... Oh, God damn it is. Oh, Jesus fuck. That's gotta be real weird in so many ways. 
That's quite enough, Mr. Nuncreed. Torment dragged on Joseph Nuncreed's face. Yes, sir. Take them away. No. I want them to see this. Ah, the ever temptious Eleanor Van Horn. You've been quite a thorn in my side. Like a weed that's burrowed in where it doesn't belong. I, I love the lady just reading the book. I must confess, you look dreadful. He paused for a moment, plucking a piece of fuzz from his sweater and discarding it to the ground. Consider yourself in rare company. You've managed to pull, your, pull one over on me. It won't happen again. I knew you had some sort of plan to disrupt our little party. But alas, I expected a something a bit more impressive than incoherent rambling. No matter. Your failures are yours to bear. Mr. Kerr. Yes, sir? It's a shame it was cut short, but I thank you for that rousing oratory. I will take it from here. Yes, sir, of course, sir. You've done quality work for me, William. You can look forward to the recompense we agreed upon. Kerr gave a bow of deference. Founder, you are most gracious. Gasp rippled through the crowd. Thankfully, we can dispense with the formalities from here on out. Solomon pulled a glass vial from his pocket. In one smooth motion, he downed its contents. A triumphant smile grew across his lips. You can all call me Sharper Valentine. His body and face began to contort and expand as he disappeared into a belching green mist. Damn, I wanted him to still stay the kid. I thought that would be funnier. A hushed horror gripped the crowd. This is a story about change. What? No! Huh. So you didn't see that coming. I did. Good. Sharper examined his new hands. Well, this is quite the improvement. Everything looks so much smaller now. Eleanor is right about one thing. This festival was a ruse. I wanted you all to witness my glorious return with your own eyes. Why does everyone look so downtrodden? This is a celebration, people. Maybe it would help if we set the mood. Mr. Kerr, be a deer and reveal the sign. <laughs> huh, wonderful. Sharper choked out a crude squawk of a laugh. Frustrated grumbles sprinkled through the crowd. Sharper, you malicious bastard. Ooh, that one's gonna be fun. Glad you're back so I can tell you to your face. You destroyed this town. We ain't gonna let you get away with it again. Sorry, this is not the time for our audience participation. Some assistance, Mr. Kerr? William Kerr gave a subtle nod to the clipboards. You coward! Does anyone else have something to contribute? A helpless quiet settled over the crowd. I thought so. Did you all truly believe you could be free of me? A town of complete and utter fools. You people should be celebrating my return. You're clearly lost without me. And that leads me nicely to my children. Daddy? I gave you both the greatest gift a parent can give. The opportunity to prove yourselves in my absence. Squandered. To say I'm disappointed would be an understatement. But I... Silence, Augustus. An adult is speaking. I don't know which is worse. A son who is completely hopeless or a daughter with such potential, who inevitably lets me down. Eris, you fail me with admirable consistency. Thankfully, I was counting on it this time. Father, I have been wasting time, my dear. What have you accomplished? I was focused on cementing our legacy. Legacy? Who needs a legacy when you can just live forever? But what about... It's all right, kiddo. I'm afraid you suffer from a complete lack of imagination. There's just no helping it. Now then, where's Joseph? You didn't take the opportunity to slip off, did you? Ah, there he is. Everyone should give him a hand. None of this would have been possible without Joseph. 
I think you've said enough. Nonsense. The people deserve to know how helpful and loyal you've been. I only did what I did because he left me with no choice. You always had a choice, Joseph. You were simply too weak to take it. No matter. Cheer up! You're about to be rich beyond your wildest dreams. You should follow Mr. Kerr's example. When I found him, he was in a sorrier state than any of you. An aging actor, desperate to recapture his youth. He played his part, and soon he'll be able to play the leading man again. Forever, in fact. If he remains loyal. That goes for all of you. Well, those who haven't already frittered away my goodwill. Beacon Pines is mine again, and I am willing to share its spoils in exchange for absolute loyalty. Are you saying William Kerr was never in charge of perennial harvest? Ha! <laughs> you think that puffed up Blathers Kite could have accomplished all of this? Don, I suppose it's time for your big exclusive. Sharper addressed the crowd with indignant pride. He'd planned this moment for so long that now, at the deed's fruition, it almost felt frivolous. You see, I needed a figurehead to close things down while I orchestrated my return. Someone to misdirect, lie, and bilk this town for a spell. So I invented William Kerr. Take your bow. You've earned it. Mr. Kerr flourished a preposterously elaborate bow. Patrick C. Montesquieu, thespian extraordinaire at your service. Founder, I just want to thank you again for this opportunity. It truly was the role of a lifetime. Wait. So this Bill Kerr was a patsy this whole time? Now that your secret's out in the open, what's to stop this town from rising up against you? Oh, that's the delicious part. Fear. Thanks to our clipboards, I know what each and every town in this... <laughs> what each and every person in this town fears most. And I will make those fears manifest for anyone who steps out of line. The choice is simple. I'm not afraid of you. Huh. <laughs> the young hero. I've kept a keen eye on you, boy. You and your friends made a habit of disrupting my plans. What a pity. If things had gone a bit differently, you might have had your moment of triumph. But that's fate for you. You can't do this! Oh, but I can. I have won. Never underestimate what a great man can do, given time. And now, time is my plaything. Perhaps the most expensive thing I've ever bought. But well worth it. <laughs> Sharper coughed up one final laugh and cracked his knuckles. Enough chit chat. Let's get to work, shall we? And so, Sharper set about remaking the town in his own image. The fertilizer factory soon reopened for business. Sales rose steadily as more and more farmers across the countryside began to swear by its miraculous properties. Beacon Pines became famous, a secretive town that for the right price shared its gift with Saul. Gifts that became more and more necessary in a world where the winters grew longer and longer. The end. This is wrong, but things are becoming clearer now. You can feel it, right? You can't let Sharper win. He might just be the key to this whole thing. Let's see. What if we poison the licorice? <laughs> there was a malice lurking behind those eyes. Like a trap. Ready to spring. Luca felt the weight of Nuncree's hand on his shoulder. Something wasn't right. He didn't know why, but something was telling Luca to get out of there. I just want this all to be over. Of course, I'm sure it will all work out soon enough. I should get going. I told Roxy I'd check for Rollo at the treehouse. Luca twisted free of Nuncree's grasp. Of course. Luca, you know your dad and I were good friends back in the day. You can come to me with anything. Anything at all. Ah, 
go, 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 go. Quick, shove him in the fountain, murder him. The festival decorations are a bit humdrum. Now, if I were to throw a festival, it would be a thing to behold. I agree, this is all more than a little sad. It's worse than sad, it's boring. What if we did a little something to spice things up? I'm listening. You know another festival sign waiting to be unveiled? It would be a shame if someone... The two scurried off, eagerly forming a plan. Gotta check in on our foreshadow lady. He looked down and muttered in a gruff voice. Mama always told me my problems would look smaller once I grew up, but my problems always seemed to go right along with me. Heavens, I sense big trouble ahead. Identify yourself, please. Nellie Modeville. I work here now. I am unable to locate you on our staff roll. Oh, I don't officially start until tomorrow. Mr. Crew said I could come in early tonight to get a few things done. Hold, please. Clarence authorized. Thank you. Our harvest awaits. Whoa. You could get a wrench to the noggin sneaking up on a guy like that. Don't scare a man while he's junkin', Sonny. Evening, Jeff. Isn't it kind of late to be junkin'? Might as well ask the same thing of you. Find anything good? Ugh, ever since perennial harvest moved in, even the junk is trash. I can learn a lot about a person by looking at what they throw away. With this bunch, it's all shredded paper and coffee cups. I'd better get going. I didn't see nothing if you didn't see nothing. See what? Exactly. No, I wanted to look at that sign. Go back. Hey, Judson. Have you seen Rollo come this way by any chance? Afraid not. It's elusive as a fish in this here pond. Rollo? He aired a long holler into the woods. Rolo! <sighs> Rolo, wherever you are, I hope you're okay. Luca felt his eyes getting heavy and plopped into the beanbag. This child passed it out a lot. Conceded to its lumpy embrace. Once again, Luca found himself in a vast black expanse. This time, he knew exactly where to go. He took a single confident step forward. The world flickered and pulsed. He found himself standing in front of the frigid air of a blazing campfire. The source. He plopped down cross-legged and gazed into the cold flame, waiting. Soon enough, the fire began to die out, popping sporadically until all that was left was a single ember. Lucas stood up and dusted himself off. He plucked the glowing ember from the cold ash, examined it, and slid it into his pocket. A keepsake. The voice of his father spoke behind him. You made me proud, buckaroo. Luca turned to face him. Dad, what is this place? A warm grin grew across his father's face. A place where everything that has been and everything that could be all wait together. Luca found himself staring at his father's face, trying as hard as he could to memorize every single detail. Wait? For what? Another voice spoke out as Luca's, Luca's doppelganger stepped forward. That's up to you. Without knowing why, Luca began to weep. Is, is any of this real? Are you real? Luca's father bent down to smudge away a tear. Of course. I'm as real as the part of you that misses me. Luca turned to look at the older version of himself. And you? Doppelganger choked back tears. I'm as real as the part of you that's angry is gone. Does that make sense? Through his tears, Luca laughed. I think so. His father pulled him in for an embrace. Time to go, buckaroo. Luca was startled from his dream by a banging on the floor. Are you in there? Commanding voice rumbled from below. 
Just as Luca sprang to lock the entry hatch, the door knocked open. Chapter 5 Dangers Big and Small Luca stumbled back. He heard the rope ladder creak under significant weight. Keeping his eyes fixed on the hatch, he inched backward toward the balcony. As his hand grasped the door handle, Luca froze. A large figure clumsily wiggled up through the hole. Oh, God bless. Stop right there! Or I'll- Sheesh, I know it's dark and all, but I figured you'd recognize me. Who are you? The large figure cocked its head inquisitively. Stop now, I'll clobber you with a baseball bat! Whoa, 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 take it easy. Luca, you need to get your eyes checked. It's me, Rolo. Nice try, but I know you aren't Rolo. You're like one of his random uncles or something. Where is he? Huh, <laughs> uncle? Luca, quit messing around. It's me. It really is you. Prove it. Flaming chicken coop, Luca. Luca's jaw dropped. He peered more closely at the man standing in front of him. Something about him was undeniably Rolo. Only bigger. Changed. How? What happened to you? When I was running away, I ran into more people in those yellow suits. They grabbed me and dragged me away. What? Where did they take you? I don't know. They threw a bag over my head. It was cold and smelled like a swimming pool. Think it was an underground lab or something? They made my hands all big. Look. Rolo proudly presented his hands to Luca. Pretty sweet, right? I mean, it would be my first pick for a superpower, but beggars can't be choosers. Rolo... It wasn't just your hands. My feet too? Dang, Pa just made me new shoes. Wait, Luca, why are you so small? Luca moved to the side and pointed Rolo to his reflection in the balcony window. What the? His hand shot up to his face. Holy Toledo! Rolo, what did they do to you? They made me drink some sort of green crud. Ugh. Actually, it wasn't too bad. It kind of tasted like licorice. Passed out and woke up like this. And then I sort of smashed open my cage and escaped. Whoa. You smashed open a cage? Kinda. At least I think I did. It's all a bit of a blur. They had you in a cage? Who are these people? I don't know who did this to you, but we're gonna fix it. Fix it? This is awesome! I'm just glad you're safe now. Luca, you don't need to worry about me. Sure, I got snatched. But got, look at it this way. I got snatched. I know where snatched people go. We may finally have a lead on what happened to your family. Maybe you're right, but this all seems dangerous. Danger. <laughs> Rolo shadow walks a few jabs. I'll take them all on. Hey, fellas, what's up? With a yelp, Rolo dove behind Luca. Did I come at a bad time? Who the heck are you? This is Beck. Sorry, something truly just bizarre just happened and I need help. I didn't know where else to go. So you're just hanging out here with your large adult friend? No, this is my buddy Rolo. This is your missing friend? One and the same. He seems a little old. I'll have you know this is a recent development. What the heck does that mean? Oh, I'm sorry, you're the one who just showed up out of nowhere. So we'll be asking the questions here. That's fair. How'd you find us? Your silly little treehouse? I think you mean our silly little mission control. I hate to break it to you, but your secret path isn't so secret. And I could hear your racket from a mile away. See, Luca, this is why we need to improve security around here. Not now, Rolo. Becky, you said something bizarre happened? Yeah, but... She shot a nervous glance at Rolo. Anything you can say around me, you can say around Rolo. This has been a weird day all around, hasn't it? Yep. Beck's eyes narrowed. Okay, so it all started when I made it back home. My first order of business was to try and salvage my hair. So I dyed it with some stuff from the chemistry set my mom gave me. Okay. Just need to play it cool. Hope no one notices. Notice what? Nothing. I was just... Come over here and let me have a look. Oh, honey, what in the world did you do to your hair? I just kind of felt like a change. This is going to take forever to grow out. You were the one who said change was a good thing, right? I was talking about your mother's new job. I 
I was talking about us moving. Well, I guess I just took your lesson to heart. Ilona tried to put on a smile. Before I forget, I came up to tell you that Nellie had to go into work. Tonight? Her and Mr. Kerr decided it'd be good for her to get some things done before tomorrow. That Kerr guy seems like a great-ass creep. Beck! He is! Him and his weird cult of personality. You are not going to ruin this job for Nellie. It means too much to her. Oh, I know exactly how much it means to her. It means enough for her to exile her daughter to this podunk town. This place sucks. People are weird. You just don't know them yet. It's always cold. We're in the mountains. You'll get used to it. I can't even pick up a single decent station on the radio. It's all banjo music and farm reports. You know I grew up in a town not that different from this one. Is that why you're better at talking to plants than people? Okay. So here's what we're going to do. First of all, you're grounded. What? In the morning, I'll have Nellie come and see what we can do about fixing your hair. You need to look presentable for the festival. But not another peep. She sighed and after a moment, looked down at Beck sympathetically. I know moving is hard, honey. But that doesn't mean you have to make yourself miserable all the time. Other people seem to have that covered for me. Oh, and if you decide to rebel by dyeing your hair more, she flashed a, a sly grin and tussled Beck's hair. I'll just shave it off for you. Think of how rebellious still look then. Very funny. Thank you. Good night, sweetie. Good night, mom. Wait, wait, wait. First of all, this town does not suck. Second, you need help because you got grounded? No. I'm so sorry you got in trouble. It's my fault your hair got screwed up in the first place. Don't worry about it. I actually kind of like this look. Great, can we get back to the story now? The next part's the important bit. I have this radio I upgraded with my mom and I was too angry to sleep, so I tried to dial in something worth listening to. Mr. Kerr, are you there? Mr. Kerr? Yes, I'm busy. What is it? Apologies, I have the founder on the line. Pass him through immediately. One moment. Hello, sir. It's so nice to hear from you. Skip the pleasantries. What's your report on our new lead researcher of deep engineering? Nellie Modville seems to be in integrating nicely. This very moment, she's working to help us meet our deadline. She offered to work overtime before I even had the chance to suggest it. Excellent. And you have faith that she's capable of finishing the work left by her predecessor? Her work must be complete before the festival. I will make sure she stays day and night until it's accomplished. Good. You know how I feel about loose ends. Yes, sir. Once she's finished the work, we need to make a determination regarding her long-term prospects in the company. Immediately, sir? I usually have more time to fully bring people into the fold. We are in the end game, Bill. After your failures with Dr. Prescott, I can't afford to take any risks. Of course, sir. No loose ends, sir. Once she finishes the work, she'll either leave the office completely committed to perennial harvest, or she won't leave at all. Perfect. So, if I might suggest, maybe we should delay, just for a bit. Oh? It's just, we seem to be rushing to hit this festival deadline, and rushing into things has caused some... issues in the past. I see. Please understand that I just want what's best for you. I'm eternally grateful for all that you've done for me. Bill, I'll make this very clear for you. I brought you in to make things run smoothly. Not to have opinions. Of course, sir. Chin up, Bill. You're only a few days away from having everything you ever dreamed of. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Whoa. Yeah. Just so we're clear, when they said loose ends, they were talking about murder, right? Like actually killing someone. Capital murder. Luca gave Rolo a quick elbow to the ribs. Who is this founder? I was hoping you guys would know. Now, as far as we know, Kerr is the top banana at Perennial Harvest. He sounded scared of this founder guy. So we have an even topper banana on the field. What the hell is my mom cut up in? Has she talked about the job much? Not really. She said she was going to come in and continue the work of someone she respected. Luca, do you think that body at the warehouse was... The person Beck's mom came to replace? That would make sense. Beck, it seems like Nellie's predecessor got, um, 
loose-ended. I'm getting that impression. Okay, so we need to get your mom out before the festival happens. That's two days away. Won't she just come home after work? The creep on the radio said they were gonna hold her there until then. So if she's not coming out, we gotta go in and get her. Beck flicked a large sheet of paper out of her pocket and slammed it on the floor. Maybe this will help. You have blueprints? Well, it's really just a welcome app for my mom's PH orientation day, but it shows the layout. Sure looks like blueprints to me. Look, here's the reception area. There's a big room marked Founder's Office. It even has the exits marked. Guys, guys, guys! We have a deadline. We have an objective. We have blueprints. You realize what this is, right? Rolo started to wiggle with excitement. I think we're heisting. This is officially a heist. Chapter 6. The Heist They spent the night and huddled around that small map, formulating a plan to infiltrate the headquarters of Perennial Harvest. It would be no small feat. A modern facility equipped with all manner of technology. Not to mention the swarm of clipboards that would most certainly be scattered throughout. By the time the sun began to peek through the car window used as a makeshift balcony door, all were in agreement. This could just work. The final day before the festival would be used to prepare. They'd need to pool every resource at their disposal, pull every favor with the thread, even enlist some unsavory characters around town with important tasks only they were suited for. Luckily, there was enough ill will and mistrust toward perennial harvest that alliances could be found at a bargain. Luca, Beck, and Rollo rubbed their eyes as they exited the treehouse. They hadn't slept at all that night. There was no time. The festival was to begin in one day and they each had their assignments. All right, quick recap. Rolo, you're gonna talk to Roxy. Cordially. Without her and Fitz, this whole thing could go bust. Me? Cordial's my middle name. Mm-hmm. How do you expl plan to explain your new... He raved vaguely at Rolo's sizable figure. Circumstance. <laughs> She'll be so happy I'm alive she won't even notice. Beck snorted an involuntary giggle. And Beck, you're, show, you're sure Alona won't just hurt, shoot this whole thing down when she hears it? She'll listen. Once she understands the danger Nellie's in, the danger we're all in, the plan will make sense. Okay, that leaves me with Jeff, then Iggy. How are we gonna persuade them? I'll think of something. They each looked at each other with sleepy confidence and nodded. Well, Godspeed. All right, it looks like this is going to go longer than I thought. I kind of had this idea that maybe we would be able to finish, but obviously not. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I certainly did. And I will see you soon. Happy Halloween.